Good morning and welcome to the Health and Human Services Committee, which we feel is the best committee. My name is Senator Brian Hardin. I represent the 48th District, which is in the world of Banner County, Kimball County, Scotts Bluff County. We rub on Wyoming and Colorado, way out there. I would uh, like to invite the members of the committee to introduce themselves, starting on my right with Senator Ballard. Bo Ballard, District 21, Northwest Lincoln and Northern Lancaster County. Good morning, my name is Lynn Walls and I represent Legislative District 15, which is Dodge County and Valley. Michaela Kavanaugh, District 6, West Central Omaha, Douglas County. Murph Rupi, uh, District 12, which is Southwest Omaha and the city of Boston. Also assisting the committee is our legal counsel, Benson Wallace, uh, research analyst, Bryson Bartels, our committee clerk, Christina Campbell, and our committee pages, Chrissy and Ken. Thank you all for being here. A few notes about our policies and procedures. Please turn off or silence your cell phones. We will be uh, hearing bills this morning and taking them in the order listed on the agenda outside the room. Um, on each of the tables near the doors to the hearing room, you'll find green testifier sheets. If you're planning to testify today, please fill out one and hand it to uh, Christina when you come up to testify. This will help us keep an accurate record of the hearing. If you are not testifying at the microphone, but want to go on record as having a position on a bill being heard today, <coughs> there are white sign-in sheets at each of the entrances where you may leave your name and other pertinent information. Also, I would note if you are not testifying, but have an online position or comment to submit, uh, the legislature's policy is that all comments for the record must be received by the committee by noon the prior day to the hearing. Any handouts submitted by testifiers will also be included as part of the record as exhibits. We would ask if you do have any handouts that you please bring 10 copies and, and give them to the page. We use a light system uh, for testifying. Each testifier will have five minutes to testify. When you begin, the light will be green. When the light turns yellow, what's that mean? That's uh-oh. Okay, no, that means speed up. <laughs> and so you have one minute left, okay? When the light turns red, it's time to end your testimony. We will ask you to wrap up your final thoughts. When you come up to testify, please begin by stating your name clearly into the microphone and then spell both your first and last name. That's the piece that we kind of all forget. Um, the hearing on each bill will begin with the introducer's opening statement. After the opening statement, we will hear from supporters of the bill, then from those in opposition, followed by those speaking in a neutral capacity. The introducer of the bill will then be given the opportunity to make closing statements if they wish to do so. On a side note, the reading of testimony that is not your own is not allowed unless previously approved. We have a strict no prop policy in this committee. With that, we will begin today's hearing. Who's up? <clears throat> Toby 189. Senator Kauf. Welcome to the best committee. The best committee. I have heard much, much great tales of this committee. Uh, good morning, Vice Chair Hardin and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Kathleen Kauf, K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N, K-A-U-T-H, State Senator representing LD31, which is the Millard area. And I come before you to introduce LB189. LB 189 amends the cosmetology, electrology, aesthetics, nail technology, and body art practice art act to provide for an exemption for natural hairstyling. Natural hairstyling means to shampoo, condition, dry, arrange, curl, or straighten hair using only mechanical devices such as blow dryers, combs, brushes, curlers, curling irons, blunt tip needles, thread, and hair binders. It also includes the use of hairspray and topical agents such as balms, oils, and serums, and the styling of hair extensions and wigs. 
So basically the things you do in front of your mirror every day. There's currently a labor shortage for positions practicing natural hair styling. It's a very, very small portion of what licensed cosmetologists do. I would ask that the committee help to address the shortage by advancing LB 189. This is something um, we have a serious problem in our state with an over-reliance on occupational licensing that tighten the market so that people can't even get in. I look at this bill as a way to introduce people to the act of cosmetology. If you are able to do some of the procedures, but not all of them, and you get to see all of the other things that people are getting to do, you are not allowed to cut, color, do any of those uh, perms or anything with chemicals. This is strictly just washing, blow drying, styling hair. I see it as a way to introduce people and let them think about whether or not they would like to, a degree in cosmetology. It also gives those people who are in cosmetology a way to earn money while they're going through school and get practical experience at the same time and exposure to the community. So that's why we're bringing this bill. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Where? Senator Reefy. Thank you, Senator. Um, welcome, thanks for being here. Of course. Uh, I have two different questions. Okay. Uh, one was, uh, who was it that asked you to bring the bill? Uh, this is Platt Institute. From the Platt Institute. I think there's some connection with hair breeding there. Yes. Uh, also, um, would you require this group to then do registration so that we know at least who they are? Is that part of your bill? Don't believe that's, I'll let Nicole decide to answer that. I don't believe that's part of it. Okay. That's all I have, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, Mr. Chair, whoever I whatever am. title you carried it in. Nice Any chair. other questions? If not, will you be around to close? <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you. For those who are proponents, you are for this bill. Would you please come forward? Welcome, Ms. Vox. Good morning, Vice Chair Harden, members of the HHS committee. Uh, Nicole Fox, NICOLE, FOX, uh, representing Platt Institute. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss LB 189's proposal to exempt natural hairstyling from Nebraska's requirements under the Uniform Credentialing Act. Platt Institute supports policies that reduce barriers and help Nebraskans to start and grow businesses. During the past couple of interims, in individuals have approached us regarding the desire to solely perform natural hairstyling for their clients. The services they want to provide include washing, conditioning, and styling hair. Given that everyday Nebraskans are performing these very same activities right in their own homes, we feel it is reasonable to request a policy change, and I appreciate Senator Kaut's willingness to make this happen. Um, just. Uh, to give you an idea of the types of people that have reached out to us and the types of business models that they have in mind. Um, there are uh, those that want to just solely style hair. You know, people, they have clients that come in for a special occasion, like a wedding or some sort of, you know, formal event, and they just want their hair styled. Um, there are people uh, that participate in natural hair braid, in uh, hair braiding, and um, they want to be out able to offer additional services to their clients, such as styling, natural styling of hair. And then there are some people that have full service salons, but they don't want to, they want to, uh, you know, get clients through their appointment a little bit faster. So maybe they're going to hire somebody just to wash the hair and then turn them over to a cosmetologist to actually do the cutting or the coloring. So those are some of the business models um, that people that have approached us would envision um, when it comes to this bill. So LB 189 defines natural hairstyling and it proposes to exempt it from Nebraska's requirements under the Universal Credentialing Act, similar to the hair braiding bill. And that bill, so the Platt Institute supported in 2016, um, and it passed and became Nebraska's first um, occupational or workforce licensing reform bill. It exempted natural hair braiding from Nebraska's requirements under the Uniform Credentialing Act. And also just to make note, additionally, here in Nebraska, <clears throat> These are some things that you don't need a license to do. You don't need a license to do airbrush tanning. You don't need a license to apply makeup. You don't need a license to pierce ears. And you do not need a license for threading to remove hair. Under current state law, natural hairstylists must be fully licensed cosmetologists or barbers. And that means natural hairstylists must complete at least 18, 
1,800 hours of cosmetology training, much of which has little to do with natural hairstyling. Nebraska is tied for the, the second highest education hours in the country at 1,800 hours, while 38 states and Washington, D.C. require only 1,000 to 1,500 hours. And I have there um, <clears throat> on your handout the regional comparison for our neighboring states. The cost of 1,800 hours of training is significant. To attend Nebraska's cosmetology schools, the tuition and fees alone add up to approximately $20,000. But if you add in the additional loans that are needed to cover the cost of living, you're talking about somebody incurring upwards of $45,000 in debt to complete training that they do not need. This cosmetology uh, license creates an expensive barrier for those of modest means just trying to break into the industry. It makes it hard for the standalone entrepreneur with a vision of offering niche services to ever be able to pursue their business idea, and it can limit the supply of workers for business owners eager to hire for narrow services but can't find fully licensed cosmetologists. We want a thriving workforce and small business community in Nebraska, so why are we delaying entry into it by requiring individuals to spend hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars on training related to skills they will never use? The starting annual salary is often less than the money spent on a cosmetology program, especially when you figure in the cost of living expenses that may also require incurring debt. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average hour hourly rate wage was $14.27, and the average median salary was $29.680 in 2021. Since 2018, five states, Arizona, Arkansas, Minnesota, Utah, Virginia, they've enacted similar exemptions for natural hairstylists without compromising health and safety. With this bill, Nebraska can continue reducing occupational licensing barriers and create new opportunities to work in the beauty industry. Nebraska's beauty industry has the opportunity to cultivate would-be entrepreneurs and workers in a niche market, but current law is posing a barrier and limiting their ability to thrive. The Platt Institute strongly supports the barrier that 189 proposes to remove. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Paul. Any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Reapy. Thank you, <laughs> Chairman Hanson. Are you at the same time recommending any changes in the curriculum? My sense is probably the most serious issue with any of the training or hours required would be is working with the chemicals and I know that some of the stuff that I have read that that can be hazardous to people that are getting hair coloring that uh, the, the chemicals put there can be problematic yeah no nothing in this bill has is proposing to um, make any changes to the cosmetology curriculum so okay. we just want to exempt things like washing drying and hair styling oh okay yep any other questions Seeing none, thank you. We'll take our next testifier in support of LB 189. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Brandy, spelled B R A N D Y, last name McMorris, M C M O R R I S. I am a hair braider out of Omaha and have been since 2016 with the success of LB898. In the last seven years, I have found that there is still a gap that needs to be bridged between practicing safe hairstyling and providing economic stability. This bill is that bridge. For the record, hair braiding is hairstyling, but there are other hairstyles that are just as safe, if not safer, involve less skill and do not require the use of any harmful chemicals. LB-898 provided a way for hair braiders to get into the industry and earn a living. I saw the emergence of so many braiding businesses that are still open today. To my knowledge there, I have not heard of any reported injuries or raised risk to the public related to this. Natural hairstyling would help hair braiders as well, I'm sorry, as well as other style, I'm sorry, will help hair braiders as well as others style hair safely while still, while still being able to refer their clients to licensed professionals, whether cosmetologists or dermatologists when, whenever necessary. Six years ago, I reached out to, to the Department of Health and Human Services and I expressed my concerns about natural hairstyling in the mandatory curriculum. 
I was informed that regulations are only given on what to teach, not how. What this means is hairstyling lessons can include only straight textures. Um, because that's at the discretion of each institution and they cannot do anything about that. They cannot <coughs> force them to teach different textures. Therefore, requiring a cosmetology license to do natural hairstyling would be a complete waste of $20,000 and a year of time. I can say this because currently I'm a student in the cosmetology program. I've done so because this was my only option to expand my business model without breaking any laws. But in this program, there is absolutely no education in the area of natural hairstyling, not wet styling it, not thermal styling it, no education whatsoever. We are taught how to change its structure and make it straight with chemicals, and we are also taught how to color it. However, we are widely educated on how to style straighter hair. To make matters worse, I am required to perform services that apply harsh chemicals, even though I do not wish to provide these services when I leave or recommend them. At this school, there are no services listed for the general public who have natural hair to come in and receive services other than straightening or coloring. I checked another hair school and the list also is void of any hairstyles specific, specific to natural hair. You must ask, why wouldn't the students be made to practice these skills if it's offered in the education? Because it's not there. Since starting hair school, my income has decreased significantly. I had to scale my business to pursue this. For the first weeks, I was in a classroom. That was nine weeks. And since then, I have been in the salon area where I roughly work eight hours a day, five days a week. That's on top of the tuition that is one-sided for the education. For 10 months, I am at the mercy of tips of clients who can only afford salon services at discounted at discounted prices. Can you imagine working 40 hours a week and bringing home $43? Because that is my current reality. After two carton of eggs, I am not even able to fill up a tank in my gas. I'm sorry, fill up gas in my tank. There is no option for part-time or to complete any book portions online, leaving little time to earn a living. This approach to training is only serving hair schools, not students. The average annual income for cosmetology is roughly $30,000. And without this bill, we will continue to exit the education program at an extreme disadvantage. We need the opportunity to earn money before drowning ourselves in debt. LB 898 was passed because hair braiding is safe, good for our economy, and did not need to be trained in hair school to prepare students to make a living from it. For those exact reasons, I'm asking you guys to support this bill. And for those who are here opposing, I want to ask you, what have you done to see about providing a, bal a balanced and equal education? Even since you have came to know about this bill, have you channeled any energy towards finding a way to stand for improvement in this area instead of only disagreeing with change? Lastly, are you listening to the problem? We, when you leave here, will you go into your circles of influence and tell them that this issue needs to be addressed? Because if it's not included in the cosmetology training, then cosmetology should not be able to regulate it. That is all I have. Thank you. We might have you sit for one second. Oh, sorry. Questions. You're doing fine. <laughs> and I've never seen so much nice hair in my life <laughs> in one room. Um, are there any questions from the committee? I have. Yes, yeah, Senator Walls. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. You um, If you could make a couple of changes with the education that you talked about that's lacking, what... And you probably said it and I missed it, but could you just give me two or three things that you think need to be included in the education? Um, so I will say that as far as um, cosmetology is concerned, it's very wide in the scope of what they teach as far as styling, and, but it's just the texture section that's, that's very one-sided. So they may teach me a lot of things about straight hair, but there's nothing on, and anyone with basic knowledge in hair would know that I can't do the same thing to my hair that I could with someone with straight hair. Um, it's structurally different. It behaves differently. It needs and requires different different things. Okay, that's a good answer. And then, can I ask one more question? Yeah. Um, in the bill, 
I'm, I waited for you because you probably know what this means. <laughs> but it says that natural hair styling means to shampoo, condition, dry, arrange, curl, straighten hair using only mechanical devices such as blow dryers, combs, brushes, curlers, curling irons, blunt tipped <laughs> needles. Those, you know, as somebody said, are just things that you use at home. I definitely okay. haven't used a blunt tip <laughs> needle and I don't know what so, it is. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So I don't know if you ever knew anybody that crocheted blankets. Yeah. So there's a certain, um, a type of hairstyle that in our culture we have and it's where we braid the hair down and we use that crochet needle to attach the hair to the braid so that all you see is the hair hanging but the braids are underneath but it basically just helps to latch that hair and drag it through the braid so that it can stay okay in there but it's not sharp in any way okay well, that's a really <laughs> i was so a little worried that I can just... <laughs> going into the scalp or something. Thank you. That's all I have. Mm -hmm. Senator Bella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. So just to clarify, so in your testimony, you said you only enrolled in cosmetology school so you could practice this natural hairstyling, or would you do, would you enroll regardless? Well, well no, I would not have. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, because my hands were tied with the way that it was before. I mean, I know there's several other people that probably would have just gone on to extend their services without, but I, you know, with the integrity that I have, I just didn't want to be doing anything that would be breaking the law. So in order to do that, I wanted to do it the right way, even though it was, you know, it's been right. a struggle. All right. <laughs> Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Any other questions from the committee? Senator Walls took my question. I was going to ask about the blunt tip needles. I don't know what that even meant. Mm -hmm. um, however, I have one more question. Uh, you do have to use some kind of chemicals, don't you? Uh, it says, well, you could anyway, the use of hairsprays mm -hmm. and topical agents, but nothing. Other right, like not anything use. harmful, not anything that would be Requires. reactive or that would change the structure of the hair permanently. You're, you're talking pomades that maybe would lay hair or hairspray that would keep it in place, you know, like oh. not anything okay. that I mean, would cause harm. Right. Just curious. Right. <laughs> well, thanks for coming to testify. Appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Uh -huh. Thank you. We'll take our next testifier in support. Hi, thank you so much, and good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of LB 189. Um, my name is Jessica Patois, so J-E-S-S-I-C-A, like rabbit or Simpson. <laughs> uh, Patois, P-O-I-T-R-A-S, and I am legislative counsel with the Institute for Justice. Um, the Institute for Justice is a national nonprofit law firm that advocates to end government abuses and overreach. For nearly 30 years, we have helped reform beauty industry laws in over 24 states through litigation and legislative efforts. We also published the first of its kind report, which has been circulated around to you all, um, Beauty School Debt and Dropouts, How State Cosmetology Licensing Fails Aspiring Beauty Workers, which details how state-mandated cosmetology programs are roadblocks rather than stepping stones. I'm a national expert on the issue of exempting niche beauty services from cosmetology and aesthetics licensing programs. The Institute for Justice supports LB 189 for three reasons. First, as you've heard many times today, um, shampooing and simple hairstyling are safe. These services pose virtually no risk to consumers. Shampooing and simple hairstyling do not use chemicals to color, dye, or to alter the structure of hair. So to um, follow up on the question that was asked of Brandy, um, chemicals, when we mean chemicals, it's anything that uh, that would alter the structure of hair, right? So that is what um, is precluded from this. Um, but I mean, technically shampoo is a chemical, right? Like, <laughs> um, but, but there's um, a lot of water between um, those, uh, those products. Additionally, the tools and devices used for these services are just as safe and common as these products. Shampooers and simple hairstylists only use combs, brushes, blow dryers, and other similar devices, things that you can find in your own home. They do not cut hair. For these reasons, traditional cosmetology programs do not work for these aspiring professionals. Rather than forcing creative professionals to fit within a box, 
that only leads them to incurring substantial debt for training that is completely unrelated uh, to their desired profession and also leads consumers to um, paying higher prices. Nebraska should repeal unnecessary red tape to lower barriers to entry for skilled professionals. So for example, with, the, um, with Nebraska's mandated uh, cosmetology curriculum, 82% of the practical training is completely unrelated to the services that we're talking about today. And 130 out of the 200 hours um, of the theoretical training is unrelated um, to uh, the, the services that we're discussing um, today. Second, LB 189 builds on Nebraska's natural hair braiding exemption. Natural hair braiding, as Brandy mentioned, is uh, another form of simple hairstyling. If it's safe for braiders to wash, dry, condition, and arrange hair, then it's safe for other and similar aspiring uh, beauty practitioners as well. Third, LB 189 is a jobs bill. It's an opportunities bill. The benefit of allowing shampooers and simple hairstylists to work freely is well recognized. I have a few examples that I'm happy to share um, uh, about some of the bills that we've passed in other states. Um, but I would just like to point out that there are 32 other states um, similar to Nebraska that exempt hair braiders. And as Nicole mentioned earlier, there are five states that currently fully exempt um, hairstylists and uh, 12 states that fully exempt shampooers. Now, shampooing kind of falls in the regulatory gray area. So some states, the exemption is much more clear and some, um, and some that they're not. But this effort is moving across the country and states are taking a hard look at their cosmetology licensing um, regulations because they're seeing that there's a lot of opportunity and growth within, within this industry, um, but they are, they are unable to um, um, meet the demands of uh, the professionals and consumers with the current um, over-regulation of the big three licenses. Uh, blow dry bars have the ability to create many job opportunities for entrepreneurs across Nebraska. Um, so, for example, in 2017, blow dry bars saw a 25% growth in both service revenues and locations, whereas in the same year, revenues for salon industries only grew by 2%. Um, finally, I would just like to say that this bill does not change the scope of practice for any of the big three existing licenses. So, this bill does not change the scope of practice for cosmetologists, it does not change the scope of practice for Estheticians, it does not change uh, the scope of practice for uh, manicures or, or nail technicians. Uh, so in conclusion, I encourage you to support LB 189 to ensure that the individuals who desire to earn a living in this state um, have every opportunity to do so and to thrive. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for coming. Are there any happy questions from the committee? Seeing none, you're off the hook. This is the problem with going last, but I really much appreciate you all for your time. Or maybe you're just so thorough we don't have any questions. Oh, well. That must be it. Thank you all. Thank you. Are um, anybody else wishing to testify in support of LB 189? All right. Seeing none, is there anybody who wishes to testify in opposition to LB 189? Good morning, oh, Senators. Welcome. My name is Shannon Bingham, S H A N N O N B I N G H A M. I am a salon owner out of Omaha, Nebraska. I have a large salon in that state. I also am a national traveling educator. And but today I'm here representing the State Board of Nebraska in cosmetology, electrology, nail technology, aesthetics, and body art. The Nebraska Board of Cosmetology, Electrology, Aesthetics, Nail Technology, and Body Art is opposed to LB 1989 introduced this, legislation se this legislative session. The board recently discussed this proposed legislation, and it is our position that natural hair selling services require licensure and oversight in the cosmetology industry for public health and safety. The board feels that adequate training for these services is vital to protect the citizens of Nebraska. Training in our cosmetology schools currently includes recognition of skin and scalp diseases and disorders and sanitation and disinfection procedures. It also covers the safe methods of use of hot tools, many which reach over 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Our cosmetology school curriculum includes business management. These classes provide information on malpractice and liability insurance and tax obligations which aid the professional with their day-to-day -day operations of successful businesses. Nebraska and natural hair care practitioners deserve the protection of proper education and licensure. 
and that is my testimony. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from the committee? I might have a couple. Sure. So I'm trying to compare what we are, what we are, what this is trying to accomplish with what other states have done. Has there been a lot of litigious action or like lawsuits in other states or um, complaints that you know of to other boards of cosmetology in other states that have followed suit with what this bill is trying to do? I'm not privy to that information at this point, but we can get that information to you. I'd be curious because I'm mean, just comparatively, I'd be kind of curious. So, all right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, seeing no questions. Thank, thank you very you so much. much. All right. Well, thank you. Next testifier in opposition. <clears throat> Welcome. Good morning. Uh, my name is Siobhan Kozacek. Are you ready? S-I-O, B as in boy, H-A-N. Last name is Kozacek, K-O-Z-I-S-E-K. I'm a licensed esthetician here in the state of Nebraska. I uh, run the Licensed Professionals Alliance Forum and Nebraska, uh, Nebraska Licensed Professionals Against Human Trafficking. And I am here to testify in opposition to LB 189. <clears throat> a means of carving out a technical type of hair care to encourage more people to enter the cosmetology film field, sorry, to determine if they want to be licensed cosmetologists. That is the response given to those who were lucky enough to be graced with the response when they reached out questioning the intent behind this bill non-technical types of hair care that should not require a license. Biology, chemistry, physics, math, accounting, economics, geometry, psychology, civics, first aid, bloodborne pathogens, human anatomy, electricity, electrical components, heat and chemical reactions, the, the ability to convert imperial and metric systems. These are all subjects that play a part in our skill set as licensed professionals. Subjects that perhaps were not recognized as our strengths in high school, but turns out we thrive in them when we learn them using our hands, our visual senses, standing, being in constant motion, engaging verbally, physically, feeling, and engaging in these subjects. A method of learning the typical American classroom doesn't accommodate. A method of learning other countries recognize and nurture beginning in the sophomore year of high school. A method of learning that Skills USA and Pathways has introduced in other states. As licensed leaders in our industry, we are ready and willing to have a seat with folks at Skills USA, Pathways, and the Nebraska Department of Education to begin diving into successful models used in other states and countries to introduce our trades to the curriculum. Skills USA already has our industries factored into the program under the Human Services Prepared. Uh, which prepares individuals for careers related in personal care and com consumer services. These programs are already in use in Texas, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, to name a few. If the state's goal of this proposed bill is to be believed at face value, to encourage accessibility into our industries, then it must be pointed out that there are already solutions in place. Electricians, plumbers, welders, contractors, and other blue collar colleagues have subjects of their trades in pathways and skilled technical services here. Demonstrating that the, the state of Nebraska recognizes the importance of their education skill set, licensing, and oversight. You do recognize we are blue collar. We are skilled trades people. You should, because unlike our counterparts in the trades, we engage repeatedly with our customers. Our relationships with our clients don't end once a project is completed or a repair is made. Our hands are physically on them. We're paid to be in their physical space from start to finish, engaged repeatedly with our customers, Nebraska voters. Since 2020, we've seen this bill. We've seen this bill. Utah had four pages, failed. Indiana had four pages that failed. Illinois, three pages that failed. Michigan gave it 13 pages that failed. Tennessee, 23 pages failed. Oklahoma, 18 pages failed. Minnesota threw six bills at this since 2020 that have failed. And Georgia failed. 
My time is a commodity. The amount of time and resources and research I put into coming here to oppose this angers me. A bill I've come to find out is copy-paste legislation going out all over the country. A lazy piece of bad legislation written at tables we've had no seat at. Franchises are accommodating corporate franchises who have bad business models. Franchises to the inexperienced and unlicensed in need of cheap labor to chart a profit. Four pages of bad copy paste. So I've got to ask, like, whose skill set is non-technical now? The audacity to determine what is required to perform our services presented in a bill of failed copy-paste legislation. We deserve better than this. The clients, the consumers deserve better than this. The state of Nebraska is better than this. We expect to actually work to go in, or I'm sorry, we expect actual work to go into the writing laws that affect our lives. We want a seat at the table when legislation is being written discussing our, that discusses our skills, affects our industries, lives, and livelihoods directly. We demand better from our lawmakers we elected to represent us. Excuse me, uh, your red light went yeah. off there. So thank you very much. So we'll just make sure, any questions from the committee? <coughs> thank you. Yes. Thanks for coming today. Um, one of the things I was thinking about when, I don't remember who it was, came up and um, was trying to explain that this is a way for people to make money without having to go through and spend, mm -hmm. spend a lot of money. And that, you know, they could work for a, another hair, hairstylist shampooing the hair. And, and I thought, you know, I wonder how much money a person who's hired to do that could really, can they make a living off doing that? I mean, it, it, it depends. I uh, take on a tech every year to assist underneath me and they are a licensed professional. Um, I start them at $17 an hour with uh, a review every three months as they train underneath me to grow them into the industry on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But again, I'm a small business owner. I'm a genuinely small business owner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there, are, there were some very good points that were brought up by the student very good points. And we can't bring meaningful legislation to the floor if we don't have a seat at the table, if we are fiddling around with copy paste legislation and we are not communicating as professionals in the industry. We can't bring legislation to the floor that asks that the curriculum includes all hair care, all skin care. We can't bring change if we begin to devalue the license itself and we are not present at these meetings or they are not present at our meetings. If we want to work within this industry, we have to come together and we need to seat at that table when these bills are being written. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Right. Seeing none, thank you for coming. Thank you. And here's one warning. <laughs> That's right. We had a long day yesterday with the exact same stuff. If we can, we'll make sure that we don't make any noise out in the crowd if we can. I know it's emotional to some people, but that way we can kind of keep things moving. So thank you very much. Good Welcome. morning. My name's Greg Howard. It's G-R-E-G, -E last name spelled H-O-W-A-R-D. I'm with the College of Hair Design. We operate a barber cosmetology and aesthetics programs in Lincoln and two campuses. Um, so I'm really here to represent the barber and cosmetology industries. Um, I really want to be real brief. Uh, and I also have one of my instructors with me today. So she has a couple comments to make as well. Um, so my main point of looking at this is that there's an issue of sanitation that's not addressed in the bill. Um, if we look at page two of the bill, lines uh, basically four, five, six, seven, I'll talk about the implements used in the profession that are included in the bill, but it does not any, is no sense, there's no discussion of how to clean or sanitize those implements. There's no addressing of that. 
Whereas if you look at our current laws of barbering and cosmetology, there's training involved, there's inspections involved. Um, so that is completely void in the language of this bill. Um, I also want to compare, if you would look at line 10 of the bill on page two, talks about minor trimming of natural hair. But then on line 26 and 27, it says does not include cutting of hair. So to me, that, that language is in conflict with one another. Um, so that's a point I really think is a par another problem with this bill. Um, again, to Impa, I wanted to say too that this bill does not address a lot of things that are addressed when someone becomes a cosmetologist. There's a year roughly of training, and then after they uh, pass the school, then they have to go through the licensure process. At that point, their character is looked at. There's a criminal history that's addressed. So you have some other things that come into play. Um, those may seem like minor issues, but I guess you just have to look at the fact that we're, we have a whole industry where you have this standard that's up here, and then you're opening the door to a whole nother door into this that really there's not a, a, there's not addressing of sanitation. There's no addressing of a lot of issues that I think are important. So, uh, so th those are my main, main concerns about this, that it doesn't address those uh, sanitation rules and the, 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 the confusion over trimming hair versus cutting of hair. Um, and again, the bill's very brief and I think it opens the door to some things that uh, I don't see any provision for inspection like normal salons have. Uh, you have the barber board who inspects, you have the cosmetology health department that inspects. So uh, that's my conclusion of my comments about the bill. Okay. Any questions from the committee? Senator Walls. I'm sorry. Um, so the sanitation piece is a piece that kind of concerns me. Um, in other states, and here I think, you can go, do you have to have a license to, to be a, what's it called? A dry bar or blow dry bar? Oh, blow dry bar. Right. Yes. You, okay, so currently you do. In other states where you don't have to, or if you didn't have to have a license. So any, it wouldn't be regulated at all. I, if I were an unlicensed blow dry bar owner, sorry, <laughs> I'm just trying to get my question out. I could, I could use the same brush and comb and whatever, and nobody would ever know that. Is that what That's you're correct. saying? That would okay. be correct. I mean, like if you go into a normal barber shop or salon, you have like a, a solution that has a quaternary ammonia or something in there for the combs and your brushes and. So there's nothing discussed in this bill about any of those kinds of issues um, that are customary and are included in the rules and regs of barbering and cosmetology. Okay. The sanitation, clean, cleaning of the salon itself and all those kinds of things. So. Okay. Thanks, sir. Yep. Any other questions? Senator Reepy. Thank you, Chairman <clears throat> Hanson. Uh, my question is this is, are these individuals required to be under the employment supervision of a licensed cosmetologist or are they free to set up an independent practice? I don't think the bill addresses that at all. But I, Is that a concern? I think that would be a concern, yeah. Um, and I don't see, if they were inside of a licensed salon and that umbrella, you would, you would be opening the door to a, an inspector or from the health department looking at their operation and how they're handling things like that. So, so okay. I think that's a concern. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I can ask a question. Yes. I'm learning a lot about hair. <laughs> yes. Is natural hair braiding and natural hairstyling the same? That, that to, to me and it, to this bill and what we have right now currently law, it doesn't seem like it's the same thing. No, this is addressing like the, the the braiding bill did not include shampooing and some of the things that are mentioned in this. Yeah, I'm just curious if they're the same thing. Why you want to? She's going to come up. Can I, I? I can ask you, or you can ask my question. When you come up here next time. That'd be fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the reason I, I ask, so yes. then I can preface it. 
um, is because then you bring up a point about like um, under natural hair braiding, it's allowed minor trimming of natural hair. But if it's not the same thing as natural hair styling, then that's the reason I think why they put natural hair styling does not include cutting hair. So they, they are different. So you're talking about there's a conflict because they might be similar. But if they're different industries, I think then they won't, there should be a conflict. That's the reason I'm asking that. So okay, I follow your train of thought. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought, it, I mean, I'm looking at the, the surface of the bill and I'm just saying, one place it says, hey, you can trim hair. Another place says you can't cut hair. Okay, what, what, what is the difference between trimming and cutting hair? Sure. That's to me the, the conflict. Makes sense. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, there's something else I was thinking about. What can happen? In, just because I'm, I'm unfamiliar. I think. Sure. I'm, I'm trying to think that, you know, what can happen from using a comb on one person to another person? <laughs> okay. I, I, just, I, I ask this because I kind of want more specifics, I think. So then if this stuff happens, it happens to get to the floor, we discuss this, I can kind of have, I, I kind of know. Right, right. There's a lot. I mean, like, I mean obviously you, I'm thinking like lice or something like that, right? You know, right. You have lice, you have a lot of else. other just, uh, you know, contracting other kinds of dermatitis, uh, contact dermatitis or different things like that. Um, I don't teach on a daily basis. I'm going to be real straight up. I'm a lice, but I, I, I'm a licensed barber. And, uh, but it, there's a lot of things that go into it. Uh, dandruff and other kinds of things. You just general cleanliness of your operation. Okay. Kind of come into play. But that's a great question. And the reason I asked that too, is because when we were to introducing more things into a bill or a law, like such as sanitation, it's like, you know, why, right? And I don't know right. why, like, is there, is there a specific reason why we're doing it? Because if not, then why, we, why we would put it in there? So you make a good point about that. I was just kind of wanted some more yeah. background information. Right? Good so, question. Thank, thank you, you very, much. very much. Seeing no other questions, thank you. Okay. Thank All you. right, we'll take the next testifier in opposition, LB-189. Hi, my name is Pia McWilliams, P-I-A-M-C-W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. Um, I'm speaking in opposition to Bill LB-189. Um, my opposition to this bill is mainly because it is written um, up. The way that it is written to me is in confusion. Um, it is written up in the way that it is written up is confusing to be a misunderstanding because to me, the way that I read it, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it is going back and forth based upon the bill that it is trying to amend. Um, I am against it because there's no way to regulate what it is asking. Um, is there going to be any regulations to um, what they are asking? Um, based upon what my boss was just up here talking about, um, I just lost my whole train of thought. I'm sorry. Let me That's right. You're doing good. Regather. I'm kind of nervous sitting up here. Um, Natural hairstyling means to shampoo, condition, dry, arrange, curl, and straighten the hair um, using only mechanical devices. Um, I do believe that they still do need a license to be able to do these things in this type of setting based upon the education and also again with the sanitation. Sanitation is a huge part of this because things can be spread around without this. Um, without this type of license, they have no you know, education on it. Um, what we teach and what this license provide is the safety of the clients and also the safety of the person performing these services in those types of settings. It is a huge thing that's missed. Um, you know, seeing these things come into the setting that I'm in every day without these things, I, I believe it's a big safety concern in the environment. Um, without these regulations in place, I feel that you know, it could put a lot of people in danger. And also, too, 
without these regulations in place, we have like, there was a big shutdown with the COVID. Without these regulations, with these people, without these licenses, um, without these regulations, would they have to be able, would they not be shut down as well? Um, I feel like there's a big gap in between, but I, sorry, I'm really nervous. So I don't think my words are coming out. That's right. As, as, as time. Should, I'm sorry. But again, with the thing is COVID, with COVID without those regulations, without being held to the same standard as the people that are licensed, would they be shut down as well? I guess is what I'm asking. Um, we were shut down out of safety concern. Would they be held to the same standard? I guess is what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Would they fit under the same criteria as we were, as the people that are regulated under the same, would they be held to the same standard? And I don't think it, they would be. And I think it's a big concern. Um, that's all that I have. Are there any questions? I that's good. Very good. Okay. Are there any questions from the committee? I was hoping you could answer my question. Okay. What was? What's the difference between natural hair braiding and natural hair styling? Like, is like, because again, I think that into the bill, it's almost like we're adding a new industry, not industry, but a, a section of hair styling. I, I hate, I say that, but uh, so it seems like natural hair braiding and natural hair styling are two different things is that correct natural hair styling and yeah. natural hair braiding yeah natural hair styling and natural hair braiding ideally are the same thing but when you talk about cutting the hair cutting the natural hair or trimming the natural hair um trimming hair and cutting hair is the same thing so when you cut the hair you are Te you are technically changing the hair, changing the composite, changing the hair. So, I mean, in order to cut the hair, you have to be, you need to be licensed to cut someone's hair. Okay. Cutting and trimming are the same thing. Okay. I don't charge a different price to trim the hair when I cut the hair. I think that's kind of, I think that's maybe why they put that in a natural hair style, does not include cutting hair. I just curious if, if, if there's anything that needs to be worked out or if there is some conflict, it's always kind of good to kind of discuss it now with people who know what they're talking about, like you, for us who don't. Um, uh, and I think that's the only question I have. Any other questions from the committee? Okay. Thanks for coming up today. You did good. Sorry if I'm too No, he's fine. I want to take the next test fire in opposition. Hi, my name is Karina McCormick, C-A-R-I-N-A-M-C-C-O-R-M-I-C-K, and my salutation is doctor, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, thank you for being here. I know you were here really late, and so I actually, more than usual, appreciate you being here. Um, I'm also excited because around 6 a.m. I had a dream about doing this, and I left out some things. So I'm really excited <laughs> to have another chance to do it again. You were really nice in my dream, asked some good questions, so I expect you'll be nice again. The reason that I came here, all these people have expertise in hairstyling, I have expertise in licensure and certification testing. That's what my PhD is in. So I wanted to approach this um, from a licensure and certification test uh, standpoint. And licensure and certification is there to protect the consumer. And it also lets consumers know that when they make an appointment, they're going to someone who's qualified. And um, one thing I really wanna point out is that the natural hair braiding exemption made sense because that's not on the test. Okay, so when you go to make a licensure and certification test, you do what's called a job analysis. So you talk about centrality, frequency, and criticality. The criticality is especially important in that that's what are the consequences if it goes wrong. Um, and so I I'd obviously haven't seen the job analysis for the Nebraska test, but like, so the hair curler, these people can tell you the temperature. I don't know, but I know it's enough to burn my ear. I, I worry about it at home, you know, but I want to make sure that the person who's doing that has been trained because there is a criticality. And that's why these, these tasks are included on the test. And that's why there's already existing the statutes that like spell out what tasks need to be um, 
included on this test. Now, the second testifier, so the first one that wasn't a lobbyist, I think, um, during her testimony, I noticed that every time she used the word natural hair, it seemed to me that what she meant is textured hair. I know you're not allowed to use props, but it's touched my head. So I'm going to point out to my hair what the transcript can show. My hair is very, very straight. Okay. So natural, so the standard cosmetology program like really focuses on hair like mine. So I know that those people are going to be trained, but the textured hair like that, that testifier, that's not included. So it made sense that if that's not part of what's on the test, don't require that test to practice it. So I think one reason I jumped in after the last testifier, she said this bill is confusing, and I do believe that is on purpose because they've they've taken the term natural, and in this bill, they're making it sound like that's anything that isn't chemical. But the way that other people have been using the term natural hair, that's for the, the textured hair that isn't purpose of a lot of the instruction in the cosmetology. So when you were saying, is there a difference between natural braiding and natural styling? I think that confusion is intentional. And I also think it's pretty insidious that there was this bill which correctly brought out an exemption for braiding of this textured hair that isn't covered in cosmetology school and that they're very sneakily adding um, doing things to a straight hair like mine as if it's the same thing as it was intended by the initial hair braiding bill. It's, it's not the same as all, at, at all. But this is intentional. And, um, you know, one of the lobbyists brought up that other states have included, have been recently adopted this exemption, and she brought it up as if it was a good thing. I would say quite the opposite. I would say that looking at the impact um, from the Goldwater Institute really shows us that this isn't something that just everyday Nebraskans are saying, I wish I could do this job without going to school for it. It's that national outside groups are pressing this into state legislatures like ours and taking away the autonomy of our state legislatures. They have this model legislation from the Goldwater Institute called Breaking Down Barriers to Work. And so it's not done for the purpose of actually reconciling the need to protect consumers. It's part of this um, this outside extremist ideology that's been pushed into, um, into state legislatures. Um, and um, I'm very concerned about just this blurring of the lines in a way that puts consumers at risk and weakens the entire concept of licensure and certification. Thank you. Is there any questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Reeky. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I think you said as you, in your introduction that you have a doctorate. Yes. What's your doctorate in? Um, I went to the UNL program for, it's called Quantitative, Qualitative, and Psychometric Methods. So psychometric methods is a particular type of statistics. Very interesting. <laughs> it is. Um, well, to me it is. That's why I did it. I'm, I'm impressed, and thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Senator Beller. Thank you, Chairman Anderson. So we've heard about sanitation risk and other risks, consumer risks, you mentioned in your testimony. Um, what other safety concerns are we missing that haven't been said? You talked a little bit about burning. Um, well, I was thinking about how I'd answer this question and I realized, you know, it's really great. I don't have to worry about that because the state has worried about it and the state has already decided, okay, let's figure out everything that's potentially dangerous if done by an unqualified person and let's require a license for it. And I can go to my hairstylist and, and not worry about the things that might be potentially dangerous because I know that that person is trained and has passed a, a test to do it. I actually thought that through, like I was making a long mental list about all the things. I have very sensitive skin, so, so actually, um, I appreciate the training about like skin reactivity. You know, they're saying like, oh, well, don't worry, it's not reactive. Well, to me it is. I have a special condition where my skin is very reactive. So I know that the training of the schools actually go, goes through, but um, the, uh, I noticed the, hit, the curlers was left out of the third proponent from that, that national institute, like, like the hair, the hair curling and also blow drying. I'd suggest you ask them about the temperature of the blow drying for like blowouts and the damage that can occur with, with that. Okay. Thank you. If I can ask one question. Yes. It's a similar question I asked before 
and maybe you do or do not know it, but I just thought I'd ask you anyway. Do you know of other states that have passed some legislation? Has there been complaints, uh, uh, injury, or lawsuits from people who have been hurt when they've created this similar kind of legislation? I didn't look that up. Um, I wonder, though, if a lot of these people have established LLCs that would, like, not allow consumers really to have a full level of protection when it comes to lawsuits. I didn't um, put a lot of research towards that, but I was thinking about it this yeah, week. And that's just fine. Just got to ask me in case you have that. So maybe like, somebody will give it to me later or whatever. So. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Right. Seeing none. Thank you. We'll take the next testimony opposition. Members of the committee, my name is Marie Nordville, M A R I E N O R D B O E. I'm a licensed cosmetologist, barber, cosmetology instructor, salon owner, former school manager, and have been working in the industry for 45 years. I'm also president of the Fremont and Columbus Area Cosmetology Association. I am opposed to LB 189. I feel it would be a mistake to deregulate hairstyling services in our state. This bill would allow any person without any training at all to legally style hair. Cosmetologists spend nearly one year in technical training, technical education training. They have confidence due to that training to handle any situation that can occur when they're working on the public. Unregulated services cannot be checked upon because they would no longer be under the Department of Health. Our salons have regular sanitation inspections and we are required to post that rating sheet in the public area that our customers can view. As licensed cosmetologists, we are also required to attend regular continuing education classes. This keeps us up on the latest products, techniques, and safety concerns. I am wondering about the quality of services, the condition of the workspace, as well as the lack of business knowledge that the unlicensed stylist would have. Does an unlicensed person know how to identify the condition that is contagious, such as head lice and ring, ringworm? Can they recognize a precancerous spot on the skin and scalp and suggest that that client seek help with a dermatologist? Would they know how to help if the client had a medical condition, such as that they suffered a stroke, a heart attack, a cut from a fall? I question whether they would pay income tax or collect sales tax and transfer that money to the city and the state agencies. Does the unlicensed stylist know how to treat a burn from a curling iron or a flat iron or a chemical burn from a product? Again, our curling irons go up to 430 degrees Fahrenheit. Do they know how to flush out the eyes if a product splashes on the client? What about allergic reactions and the toxicity of non-professional unregulated products. In the industry, we tend to go with one line of products and we seek the education. We know what's in those products. If you buy something off the shelf at Walmart, you don't know what's in there. And the, our last speaker spoke about her sensitive skin. A lot of times it's the fragrance alone that can cause problems. In the professional industry, we now have products that have no fragrances, no color. And so that helps people that have sensitive skin. Do these untrained individuals know how to handle another COVID crisis to keep our customers safe? During COVID, we moved chairs apart. We had one person in a room at a time. We put away the magazines. We scrubbed the doorknobs. We did not allow them to touch a chair that had not been sanitized. We did not use a cape over it. We put cloth under the cape. There's many, many things that we do daily to prevent the person from having a problem. We shampoo. Um, we sanitize the shampoo bowl so that the next person's neck does not touch where the last person's skin was. I also have concerns about unregulated hair extension services. It is estimated that the blunt tip needles nick the scalp of the client about 24 times a session. There are some methods of doing hair extensions that require a small braid. And you take something that is similar to a upholstery needle and you go in and you stitch this artificial hair to this little braid that's made on the client. So when you go in, there's the opportunity to 
cause a little bit of a blunt force trauma and scrape the skin. Is that needle being disinfected between? Because you can cause a scrape with blood and you have blood to blood contamination. That is the perfect way to cause a problem. There's another method of doing hair extensions that requires a bead be smashed onto the hair and that is called a lock nut and that attaches it. But around the facial hair, this hair is very fragile and is not as deeply implanted in our scalp. So with extra weight on the wrong hair, it can pull out your own hair. This leaves bald spots and pole burns. As a licensed cosmetologist, I urge you to not move forward with LB-189. I am concerned about the health and safety issues as well as the potential for tax evasion. And on the back, I've included what our Nebraska schools teach. If you go to the very last page, you'll see that I put some stars by 200 clock hours of hairstyling. And when it says five shampoos, conditioners, scalp treatments, that doesn't mean five shampoos. That means five hours of shampooing. You can do a lot of shampoos in that time. Infection control, 20 hours. Those are some highlights of the questions that were asked today. Do you have questions for me? Thank you for your testimony. Are there questions from the committee? Yes, Senator Reeping. I have a curiosity question. Mm -hmm. uh, if you owned a salon and you rent chairs, uh, would you rent to an individual who's proposed under this legislation? No. Okay. But having been an educator, I realized the importance of sanitation. They would know nothing. I would have to train them on everything. One of the things that I see happen in our own homes is we put that curling iron in there and we have no protection for the scalp. Well, standard cosmetology procedure is to put a hard rubber comb between the scalp and that curling iron. If somebody does that and has the wrong kind of comb, you melt that plastic onto the person's scalp. So there's so many safety concerns. You know, we learned that with COVID. You got to sanitize everything. I'm just glad I'm a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a beautiful hair color. Well, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm curious about your position on tax evasion. Well, I just feel that? like a, these people that, yeah, it may be a blow dry bar situation and maybe the owner can keep track of everything. But if Betty Jo decides that she wants to do it in her kitchen, she can. Under this bill, she can. And so what's to say that she's like, oh, that's just fun money. I'm just going to put that away. Pay me in cash only. There is nobody to check up can, on anything. Can I follow up with that? Sure. So somebody who's gone through all the hours of cosmetology, mm -hmm. can they also do that? Can they go they could do that, but they have business and salon management training that talks about having malpractice insurance, paying taxes, turning in retail taxes. Uh, many of the schools, and in fact, the school that I used to teach at, the students had to set up their own salon and give us their business plan, their decorations, their business plan. So I think they're better informed about how to do things. There's always that potential that that could happen. But again, it seems you like don't... the question you're posing makes it sound like people who do natural hair styling are more fraudulent because they're bad people. Oh, uh, no. Um, what I meant was that it could be a very small operation. It could be a hobby. Soak and cutting doing, hair, right? What's that? Soak and cutting hair, right? Uh, it usually cutting hair is done in a professional salon. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Just to make sure. All right. Thank you. Okay. We'll take our next testifier in opposition. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Skylar McKaig, S-K-Y-L-A-R-M-C-C-A-I-G. 
I'm with Capital Beauty School, a cosmetology and aesthetics institution here in Nebraska for the last 100 years. Um, first off, thanks for allowing us to voice our opinion on legislative bill 189. Um, what I've passed around to you um, is an example of what the Department of Health and Human Services Board requires in our curriculum for um, our school and all the other schools across the state of Nebraska. So in our schools, students cannot touch a live human being until they are experienced with 200 hours of minimum training. And of those 200 hours, we cover hairstyling, both wet and thermal styling, shampoos, conditioners, scalp treatments, general sciences, including infection control and diseases and disorders, and Nebraska statutes, rules, and regulations. Once they are completed with this basic or freshman training, they're allowed to go on to advanced training, of which 200 hours include everything I mentioned above, as well as infection control, human anatomy, and chemistry. And of their 1,165 hours that they're required to work on like practical training, and to use the, the words directly from the Department of Health and Human Services, services performed on the public following infection control methods, 200 hours of these are in hairstyling, five hours in shampoos, conditioners, and scalp treatments, and 20 hours on infection control. So in our school and uh, the other schools that are here as well, our students are uh, trained on how to sanitize their combs, brushes, proper use of products, and the downside that can come to not doing those techniques. The natural hairstyling allowances for unlicensed individuals that's proposed in Legislative Bill 189 um, would basically account for 625 total hours of the DHHS mandated requirements of Nebraska cosmetology schools. And again, these are hours that we are training students in order to protect the public from harm. Unlicensed individuals would have no such training. Um, again, I've got uh, Capital Beauty School, which is what I'm representing. We had Mr. Greg Howard from College of Hair Design just down the road here in Lincoln. Right behind me is Stephanie Moss, who owns uh, Zanon Academy in both Omaha and Grand Island. And the three of us have all agreed that we'd love to have all of you senators come and visit our schools. I think it'd be a great thing for you to see what we do every day. Um, the training that we provide our students is top notch and they really learn a lot from us. And um, we have great students, the public that comes in, we have regular clients that have been seeing us for literally decades and generations in their own families. Um, some of the products and devices listed in LB 189 can really be extremely harmful to people. Um, with untrained use, some of these irons can get, as everyone's mentioned earlier today, over 400 degrees. Uh, some of the blow dryers are 1500 watts. So yeah, you can really harm people. You can burn the skin. If you leave some of these irons onto the hair too long, it will literally singe the hair off and the hair will just fall off. Um, just 24 days ago, on January 9th, a 14-year-old in Detroit, Michigan, was um, getting her hair styled by an unlicensed stylist. So apparently that's, you know, um, a, a thing in Michigan. So she's now in Detroit Children's Hospital. She was getting her hair styled, and the unlicensed person put a hairspray can next to a stove that heats up curling irons, and this heat caused the pressurized contents of the hairspray can to explode into her face. So to answer your question earlier, she's lost vision just 24 days ago. She's only 14 years old. So Tanasia's got to deal with that. She's got a broken eye socket, broken nose, and fractures in her facial, um, or sorry, excuse me, bones, excuse me, mouth fractures. Um, what is the purpose of this bill is to get people working in the cosmetology field um, 
our schools are full of students that are eager to graduate and work in Nebraska's fantastic salons. And I would like you to take a look at young Tanasia here. Um, that is her in the hospital from being serviced by an unlicensed person. I just am concerned that we've got um, no oversight here and there are too many allowances here for um, unlicensed people to be working in unlicensed salons. I, excuse me, your red light's on. Oh, excuse me. Yep. Uh, are there any uh, guests, questions, uh, Senator Ricky? <clears throat> I have a comment and a question. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your being here. Thank you. Uh, as a capital beauty salon, you're in the end of the business end of the deal. Have you looked at having a program much like a lot of doctoral programs in the process of getting your doctorate? You, by being around, you pick up a master's degree on the way. So do you have any, have you looked at any programs where you would have a shortened program, maybe 300 hours or something like that? that would give them this basic training you're talking about. Maybe they get a certificate lesser than someone that, that's there to become a beautician. So it's a, it's another, another stream of, and it can, I think, meet the concerns would be affordable maybe to these students. And yet uh, for your business, another stream of income. Well, Senator Reapy, um Good idea. I think that's better than this legislative bill, for sure. Um, I think that's a middle ground that I have seen in a different state. Um, and other states have been mentioned today. Again, I think it's kind of critical or important to think of, um, you know, what's good for Nebraskans and what do Nebraskans really need. I just don't see um, hair, hairstyling as a standalone service to be that much of a a, a draw, honestly. Um, I don't think of the, you know, salon owners sitting beside me and behind me here, I don't believe many of them would prefer to hire someone that cannot color the hair, cannot do perms or chemical treatments, and cannot cut the hair. So I don't see really the reasoning behind the hairstyling bill as as allowing unlicensed people to do it. Again, I think what it does is opens up, if this were to pass, it would open up unlicensed people to be working out in Nebraska and it would confuse Nebraskans as far as, am I going to somebody that's licensed or unlicensed? Okay, I think Senator Reby had that. Okay, mm -hmm. more. I know this goes back a number of years, but there was a piece that uh, in the HHS committee maybe five years ago that came forward that uh, challenged the number of hours required for cosmetologists to train in Nebraska. And uh, that was a rather controversial hearing, as I recall. I still have some emotional scars that, you know, sort of, <laughs> I call it post-traumatic syndrome uh, after that hearing. But I'm saying this might be an offshoot of maybe not getting to where people felt that the total package of training was, I'll use this my term, I don't mean to be inflammatory or excessive, by a couple of hundred hours or something like that. I think that was the original legislation. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'll just ask you if you have a response to that. I can't at this time tell you whether we ever made any. Did we lower the hours of training? Yes, sir, we did. Yeah. I'm well, fitting uh, for the HHS committee. <laughs> So yes, sir, you were you were there um, I was. that day. I was as well, and again, some most of the people behind me right now were were here. So um, I hear you about the post traumatic stress. Uh, it was, it was a pretty uh, heated argument. So uh, to further on Senator Reapy's um, comment, there that was a Nebraska was always a twenty one hundred clock hour state, which was the highest in the country for quite some time. Iowa, our next door neighbor, still is a twenty one hundred hour state, but uh, that was about three years ago, uh, to my recollection. What year? We're in 2023 now, right? Um, Maybe a little bit more. I think it was uh, five years ago. It's 2018. I'm thinking it's I'm a year behind. Um, five years ago, uh, it dropped down to 1,800 hours. So that was challenging for all of our schools to um, change that curriculum, but we were able to kind of, you know, rotate and 
and uh, meet those new demands. But um, 1,800 hours, again, is, is quite able to be completed in one year's time, and we are able to cover a lot of these important sanitation. Mr. Chairman, as a peacekeeper, we did pass legislation that allowed for salons to serve wine. Hey. So that was our little kiss and makeup routine. So. Which has been very popular for a lot of salons. And the wine and, industry and, and, pleased with it as well. and the public probably too. They can serve wine. I didn't know that. They have to get a you have a beauty salon for a while, obviously. Uh, anybody else? Yes, I have a brief question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Have you seen a downtick in applicants to your school as oh, Oh, was probably had yeah. anything else to add no. to that? No. In fact, we are booked up um, for the next calendar year, uh, completely full for 2023. And um, we are, that's for cosmetology. We are completely full in our aesthetics program into 2025, right at the moment. So it's extremely popular. So what we are looking into is some uh, alternate part-time scheduling that um, I think Ms. McMorris was uh, kind of alluding to with cosmetology being a full-time gig. Hey, I, I will be the first person to definitely adamantly testify that, yeah, it's a grind for our students that are doing a full-time gig at our schools. They're there for 35 hours in the week um, and then a lot of them have families to go home to and jobs to go home to go to as well after you know, standing in a salon clinic all day. Go back down yep. If anybody has any other questions. Okay. Good. Love to have you guys out for a visit, though. I think that'd be yeah. great. Thanks for coming, though. It's like yeah, thank very you. Informative. Actually, appreciate it. We'll take the next test for our opposition. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Stephanie Moss, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E, -E, Moss, M-O-S-S. -S. And I am opposed to LB-189. Um, I come to you as a licensed cosmetologist for the last 20 years. I also sit here as a salon owner. I own Stephanie Moss Salon in Omaha here, and I employ about over 20 licensed staff. I am also one of the owners of Zanon Academy. That is, as Skylar said, one of the other beauty schools here in Omaha and also in Grand Island. With that, I've also been a national artist for L'Oreal Professional for about 12 years, which allows me to travel all over the United States and hire and give advanced education. With all this experience, I find it very concerning to see this bill being passed. As a salon owner, I offer hire students directly out of beauty schools. Before allowing them to work on guests, we do additional training and associate programs to ensure they are 100% fully prepared and providing safe and quality services. I know many of my other amazing fellow salon owners do the same thing before allowing them to fully accept guests. As part of becoming a licensed cosmetologist, you are required to be trained in sanitation, skin, nail diseases. This is essential to ensure guests are not receiving services if they have any communicable diseases and how to properly sanitize the tools and equipment for safety of all of our guests. The seriousness of sanitation and safety to our guests was highlighted in the spring of 2020 when our industry was required to close by the state of Nebraska due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The lawmakers at that time believed our industry worked closely enough with individuals we were not able to provide services. Once able to open, we were held significantly to higher standards in distancing and sanitation. If this bill is approved, there's no way you can monitor or regulate who is able to perform services and who will monitor those sanitation standards. As being licensed through the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services, we are subject to unannounced inspections to ensure we are always up to code at all times. This bill includes the ability to do hair extensions. While some may think it is not difficult, it requires training and certification to ensure your guests 
is a good candidate and support can and it can support the additional weight of extensions without causing breakage or even permanent damage to the scalp. Guests can de develop tension alopecia or even experience pus filled ulcers and blisters on their scalp if it's not addressed and it may become infected. And I did um, attach a second page there with a few photos that's just showing what tension alopecia can actually look like to a guest. Safety of our guests is the utmost importance. And as a licensed salon owner, I'm required to have insurance on all of my stylists in the event that any guest may be injured during a service. Working with hot tools can cause burns and you should be trained what to do if such would occur. If this bill is approved, I'm concerned about the unregulated, uninsured, and untrained groups of people performing these services that they are not qualified to do. Thank you for your time, and I believe that you will make the decision that provides safety and quality care to the residents of your districts in the state of Nebraska. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Yes, and our just curious, what do students get paid when they get to the hands-on portion of, of training? Do you know what that can be? Or So are you talking after they've graduated from cosmetology school itself and working in a salon? Well, I guess I'm saying during the internship portion or when they finally do get to touch humans. So that portion for me that I referenced in the top portion of it would be like if they're coming to work for my salon company. Okay. So I have the school and I have the salon. Right, during the school portion of it, it cannot be a paid position as they're paying to be in school. Um, but when I hire them for my salon company, we pay them, we start them at $15 an hour. But with that being said, I think the big difference is, is if I can just touch on, would this help me as a salon owner to be able to have some of these staff that maybe don't have to go through this education, could they help me? We are a 90% chemical-based company right everyone gets hair color anymore or their smoothing service or whatever that might be and so my associates that work on me they are helping with we're hands in right from the get-go they're not just watching me we're working on things guests together for them to constantly just get better better be more comfortable but they're applying chemicals day one gotcha yeah thank you other questions uh senator Reby. thank you thank you for being here i'm very impressed you uh one academy is in my district, so thank you for being there. Thank you. I hope you're paying taxes. Uh, <laughs> I'll think I am. No. I, I, I'm, I'm impressed you've been you're obviously good at business and you've done very well. well. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, one quick question. Do you know where these pictures came from? So those ones are not actual guests of anything. I just Googled and you could go under attention alopecia right online. Okay. And you'll pull it right up that way. Okay. Yep. Cool. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you Good. for your testimony. Thank you. Guys. We'll take the next test fire in opposition. If I can, can I get, thank you for coming. It, sorry to interrupt for two seconds. Can I get a, a raise of hands? How many people are still willing to, are going to testify on this? Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Hi. I'm Beth Smith. I'm an owner of Blue Mint JB Salon. I've been in the business 35 years. I've been a salon owner for about 14 years. I've put two daughters through cosmetology school, about $40,000. I feel like this bill is a slap in the face to everybody in our industry that has worked so hard. Um, we've talked a lot about sanitation and dangerous things. I want to talk a little more about the business side of it. I'm telling you as a spawn owner, I don't know where these statistics came from, but there's no labor shortage. There are schools put out great students. Um, there's plenty of them to hire as a salon owner, my challenge is to keep them busy, to keep them at an income so they don't leave the business. I want them to do well. I want them to make six figures. And yes, salon hairstylists in my circle make six figures, not the 20,000 or whatever the statistic was. So, so why deregulate 
part of our services and give it to somebody that hasn't worked for it, that hasn't paid the money to go to school, taking away styling is going to kill our wedding business, our homecoming, our prom. And I don't know, it's just not right. Um, I feel like this bill, I mean, I'm going to call it what it is. It's for big corporate salons. It's for so dry bar or whoever it is doesn't have to pay a stylist what they're worth. It's not for small business at all. It's not for stylists who work their butt off building a business from the ground up. It's not for anything we stand for. Um, I do, um, I do agree. I do believe um, to get a cosmetology license in Nebraska, we should have some stricter testing. Um, there was talk about cosmetology fees being too expensive. Well, nursing fees are expensive. Are you going to deregulate part of nursing too? Like it, it makes no sense to me. Um, and customers, how are they going to know? Or is somebody going to say, oh, I'm going to do your hair today, but I don't have a license. Or they're just going to assume that somebody has a license. Somebody is, somebody isn't. I would never hire anybody without a license, nor is there even a demand for it. This is not about that. This is about big corporations not wanting to pay people what they're worth. Um, I don't know, that's just, I guess that's pretty much all I have to say. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you. I'm all like nervous. <laughs> I don't know why. Don't worry, we're all just staring right at you up oh, here. God. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you for coming. Thank I appreciate you. It. We'll take the next test for an opposition. on here so I can see. My name is Linda Pohop, L-I-N-D-A-P-O-C-H-O-P. I have been a licensed cosmetologist for 35 years and a licensed cosmetology instructor for 30 years. Mm -hmm. I am currently the director of education at Sanan, a Stephanie Moss Academy. I also teach continuing education classes nationally for a distributor on salon sanitation and human trafficking that are continuing education hours for people all over the United States. Once again, I find myself here defending our industry and license from deregulation and interference from special interest groups looking to make changes in our industry without the understanding of what the impact of these changes will cause. My first point will be to discuss that the majority of salons in Nebraska and then the districts that you are elected to represent are small businesses ran by sole proprietors. They are not these large franchises that may push the change in regulations for their individual interests. Allowing unlicensed persons to provide services in a way to lower the wages and pay for underqualified workers rather than offering a competitive rate and employing qualified stylists. Interestingly, in the last three years, these large businesses have tripled their number of franchises. However, their hourly wages that they're paying their stylists have not met that. They have not equally risen. And after researching these companies on Indeed, which I included in there, um, those are reviews from people that have worked at those types of franchises. And as you go through and look at that, you're going to notice that for a lot of them, they're saying, you know, I upgraded, I sold more stuff, I didn't get increase in pay. So those people are working an hourly wage. And it kind of reminded me of like what happened when Walmart said, yes, we're going to raise the minimum wage for our, our people. Guess what happened? When you go to Walmart, there's no more checkers anymore. 
So yes, they agreed to do something, but then they turned around and just got rid of the position. So it's not these small salons that we have in Omaha, Nebraska, and Grand Island, and Schuyler. These places are not the ones that are looking for this labor. It's these bigger franchises that are not willing to have a business model that's going to compensate somebody that wants to go work there. They're having a problem filling their places because they do not offer a position that somebody that's licensed wants. That's kind of, you know, what's happened there. So as we start thinking about this, it's like, who's really going to benefit from this? Because it's not going to be the person that's standing behind the chair, if they're even standing behind the chair. We spent, again, a considerable amount of time and money on our curriculum to train our students in the best business practices to have lucrative careers. Our goal is to send our students into the industry prepared to become industry leaders and professionals. My second point to discuss of this is that your regulating nursing services will have an important impact on the state by providing those ser these services in unlicensed places, such as their homes, since this isn't a regulated service. Who is going to ensure that the space and the service providers are following guidelines of sanitation and safety for the public? What this is opening up is for an industry of kitchen beauticians who are not professionals that are going to skirt around what is and isn't regulated. And don't kid yourself to think that they're going to stop with blow drying, styling somebody's hair. Sanitation is something, again, we've already kind of talked about that with the COVID outbreak and what happened there. But this is setting up a standard for these unlicensed people to work in a cash business, again, where they're not going to be reporting income, paying taxes on their income, which does hurt all of us. My third point of this that we're going to talk about is going to be something that we thought we had gotten resolved with the nail salons. And it's this unlicensed person working in a licensed facility. So when people go into nail salons, they do not realize that if they're getting a natural nail service, they most likely are having somebody who is not licensed doing that service. And if anybody has ever been into a nail salon and they've seen like the cheese grater that they've pulled out to put on somebody's foot to remove calluses, know that as a licensed person, if I did that, I'm breaking the law. They are not, but because they are not licensed and not regulated, nothing happens to that. There's a lot of, in the handout I also put. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to cut oh, you off. Sorry. sorry we got the red yep. light. We got a lot of tests first. Yeah. Uh, is there anybody in the committee willing will to ask a question? Okay. Seeing none. Okay. So sorry to cut you off here. No, that's good. Okay. okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We'll take our next test for our opposition. Hi, my name is Heather Schultz, uh, first name H-E-A-T-H-E-R, last name Schultz, S-C-H-U-L-T-Z. I am a former, uh, I went to uh, cosmetology school here in Lincoln at College of Hair Design 25 years ago. Although I do not have a salon anymore, which I did for about 10 years, and I've worked in salons um, due to health reasons. I, I no longer practice, but I keep my license active because it's a way of, if by chance I'm out of a job, it's something I can always fall back on. I worked hard. I put in 2,100 hours at that time. I paid back then roughly $12,000 to go through the cosmetology program. I added on the barbering program as well. At that time was $15,000. 25 years ago. So if we're putting a price tag of 20 on it today with inflation costs, it's not really increased all that much. I've worked hard. At this point in time, you guys have knocked it down from 2,100 hours to 1,800. You've taken away the continuing education requirements, which used to be 16 hours down to eight. How much more is going to go? I worked hard as well of all a lot of these other people sitting behind me and a lot of those that are not here today to speak on our behalf. At that time, I um, went to school with people that were right out of high school, single mothers, 
mothers that, that had families, um, people that wanted a career change, every walk of life. There, there are many options available to anybody, whether you go to a small private school, a hair school, a university, there are funding options available, many student aid options. Um, so I feel that this bill is contradictory in language. It really only focuses on one thing, and that's Brady. Um, you, you outline in this bill that electrology, aesthetics, nail technology, and body art. But it seems today that we're only focusing on one thing, which is braiding. And technically, we're going to call it what it is, ethnic hair. Um, I learned in school how to deal with ethnic hair. I've, I've had uh, customers that, that chose to come to me through my duration of school to uh, see me um, as their client. And... I, you know, you work with all hair textures when you go through cosmetology school. It, it not focuses on one hair type. You learn all types. And, and I did many types of braiding. Uh, you name it, we learned it. Um, I also have to learn the bones, muscles, nerves of the head, face, and neck because that's what you're touching. That's what you're dealing with. Um, you also have to learn the state laws, regulations, and sanitations. When you graduate, though, is where you really hone in on what it is that you want to focus on. You can, you can focus on everything that you learn in school, or if there's something that you really enjoy, whether it be the braiding, coloring, perming, texture, styling, cutting, whatever. Um, you, you get to choose. You get to finally choose, after you've learned all this, which way you want to go with it. And there, you can focus on one specific area or many. Um, but by passing this law, you, I feel, are devaluing those of us who have put ourselves through school. We've worked hard. Um, I, I, my, my school was full-time, 40 hours a week. Um, with four hours each night. So I put in 44 hours of school. And I also worked a full-time job. So it can be done. It's whether or not you want to. And then I hope that those of you that are sitting on this panel have actually learned something from those of us who are opposing this LB-189 bill that you're trying to pass. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Oh. I would, Senator Amy? I would always say we're not trying to pass it. We're hearing to see whether we should consider it. So okay. I don't want you to think that we're biased one way or the other. But thank you. Okay. Thank you for coming today, too. Appreciate it. All right. We'll take our next testifier in opposition to LB-189. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for taking me today. Um, my name is Juliana Kaler. It's spelled J-U-L-I-A-N-N-A-K-O-E-H-L-E-R, and I am representing Seven Salon. Um, there's a couple things that I'm going to mention because it brought up extensions. Um, with the extensions that I do in the salon, I do have to prep the hair, and that requires a shampoo um, and knowing which shampoo it needs to be used on the hair in order for the extensions to maintain in the hair for the right amount of time. Um, to answer your question about natural styling and natural braiding, it's all natural hair. Hair is hair. Um, so on top of that, I paid for my extension services on top of my education. Um, so with that, I was at $28,000 for school and anywhere between $300 and $3,400 can go into your extension education, which means they can confirm or deny you if you get into that program. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up is we just developed into our industries after being awarded the Mission and Ministry Grant from CHI Health to fund work in supporting education and educating us in human trafficking and prevention and intervention in 2020. This bill gives traffickers a place to take their victims to be groomed for their abusers. Service by untrained providers that have no idea what they are looking at or how to report safely. How will we, how will an unlicensed provider recognize if they are being misclassified as far as income? Taxes, unlicensed providers are often victims of labor trafficking. Um, these are just some bullet points that I wrote down today just to give you guys. Um, and that's all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you for thank coming. You. Take the next testifier in opposition, please. Floor is yours. Good morning, Senators. Um, my name is Lydia Nims, L-Y-D-I-A-N-I-M-S, Nims. I am the current co or owner of uh, Joseph's College Cosmetology. I am a licensed cosmetologist. Uh, I am a licensed instructor. I've been in the business for since 1965, going on 58 years. I know I don't look like that, but yeah, <laughs> I started when I was 12. Okay. Um, anyways, senators, I'm here today to talk about LB 189 and the adverse effects it will have if past. My many concerns are for Nebraska citizens, salons, and beauty professionals. The first concern, like most people have talked about, is safety for salon clients. Untrained people operating in an unlicensed salon setting is dangerous to the public. The list of hazardous possibilities is long. So many things can go wrong without professional training and knowledge of safe practices. A current cosmetologist is trained in health sciences that include anatomy, physiology, sanitation, skin structure and growth, hair and scalp properties, hair and scalp disorders and diseases. Clients deserve a reasonable expectation of competency. Please do not put the public at risk with untrained individuals. Nebraska's 6,991 licensed cosmetology professionals have rightfully earned credibility regarding the public trust and safety. They have worked hard, to learn their train, trade, they understand the importance of licensing and education. Specifically, they have documented hours in hairstyling education. Yearly continuing education is also required. In Nebraska, it is eight years of continuing education for a two-period or two-year license period. In addition to that, cosmetology instructors have to have another four hours of continuing education in methodology. Um, basically, this bill is also going to put current cosmetologists and salon owners at financial life, their financial livelihood at risk. I am also concerned for the businesses. I am citing three sources that state the average salon profit margin is 8.2%. Haircutting and styling comprise 38.4% of salon revenue in beauty services. Other hair care, such as perms, blow dry, and texture modification, make up an additional 4.2%. It is not unreasonable to see that business taken away from natural hairstyling undercuts the 8.2% 
profit margin to stay in business. Most salons are small business owners. They do not have the capital to weather in event, in eventable losses in revenue. Booth rental operators have the same dilemma. Here is the definition of natural hair styling and braiding according to Milady, whose cosmetology curriculum we use. Milady has been in education since 1927. With the natural hair styling and braiding world, hair is referred to as natural or virgin if it has never had any chemical treatments. Some Nims. people use these. Nims, your red light is on. Sorry to cut you off again. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you, I know you can all read. Yep. So uh, the rest of the testimony is there. Yeah, along you're just, yeah. With, Sorry to cut you off. You're almost done too. So hey, can, uh, just to make sure, are there any questions from the committee? Okay, I just want to make sure. Thank you for coming today too. Yeah. All right. I'll take the next test for in opposition. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Senators. My name is Ken Brockmeyer. Ken, K-E-N, Brockmeyer. It's a long one. B-R-O-E-K-E-M-E-I-E-R. Um, I'm reading this testimony for Nebraska Cosmetologists United. As of this morning, we've had 1,175 people sign this petition. Um, for the record, I am reading the petition as a Nebraska citizen and for the many people opposing LB 189 that are not able to attend today's public hearing. Um, Nebraska Cosmetologists United is a grassroots organization and it's comprised of cosmetologists, barbers, estheticians, nail techs and supporters of the industry. So here is the petition. Dear senators, I am requesting that you say no to LB 189, the Nebraska Natural Hairstyling Bill. I am concerned that the current cosmetology license is being reduced to an unsafe and unprofessional level. This bill attempts to fracture the cosmetology profession and my livelihood. LB 189 would allow unlicensed individuals to shampoo, dry, arrange, curl, or straighten hair using mechanical devices such as blow dryers, combs, brushes, curlers, hot curling irons, blunt tip needles, thread, and hair binders. It also includes the use of hairsprays and topical agents such as balms, oils, and serums. Styling of hair extensions and wigs are added. On the surface, this might appear okay, but to understand what really goes into professional hairstyling, it requires a much more in-depth knowledge. Natural hairstyling is an extension and continuation of everything a professional has learned while being mindful of safe practices. It is, the, it is important the public stay protected a current cosmetologist is, in, is trained in health sciences that include anatomy, physiology, sanitation, skin structure and growth, hair and scalp properties, hair and scalp disorders and diseases. Without training, how does someone even understand the proper sanitation methodology to ensure safety for the client and the Nebraska public? Where are the necessary safeguards. This is really important. Injuries are not always immediately evident, but they can cause physical damage later. Skin rashes can result from product usage, 
Another example of plant safety would be a burn caused by a thermal tool. tool. It may be considered minor, but that doesn't mean the burn is not dangerous. Even minor burns can be painful in, and also increase the likelihood of bacterial infection and cause scarring. Let's create a better Nebraska safety with the inclusion of our licensed beauty professionals. Please stop LB 189. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much for, for listening. listening. Seeing no questions, thank you for coming. Appreciate Great. it. <laughs> Take the next test fire in opposition. Good morning. Morning. My name is Rebecca Wiesman, R E B E C C A W E S E M A N. I'm an area developer and franchisee for Sport Clips. We're a national company. I have a salon in Omaha and in other states as well. I am here today also as a uh, licensed healthcare professional, professional in the state of Nebraska, and I don't want to reiterate on many of the things that a lot of our um, professional people in the audience have said today, but I do want to reinforce the concern related to this bill and for those people that would be doing services, perhaps inside their home, the concern related to sanitation is definitely a high one. Um, Bloodborne pathogens are a true concern. I worked with many patients for with the liver transplant program in U, at UNMC for 27 years with hepatitis C. So certainly sanitation needs to be of the utmost uh, thought within this. Um, secondly, I do believe that allowing for people to do these kinds of services would be a gateway to in-home personal business and no way to track their claiming uh, income for their taxes. At this point in time, if you're licensed, you get caught doing something in your home that you should have had licensure for, you can certainly lose your license and your ability to provide those services. I do believe that the conversation related to a 300 hour degree program that would provide licensing is a good reasonable medium that would allow for the people that are looking to do these types of services without doing uh, chemical service or hair cutting would be a reasonable solution. And lastly, I just want to reiterate that in a company like ours, even when we have licensed cosmetologists that come to work for us or licensed barbers within the state, we continue to provide for our employees paid education that's ongoing, particularly in the area of multi-textured hair with textured mannequin heads and et cetera so that they can receive ongoing training, which then does qualify related to their six hours of continuing, um, or eight hours of continuing education credits that they need in the state of Nebraska to renew their license every two years. Thank you. Thank you for coming to testify. Are there any questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, thank you for coming. Thank you. Is there anybody else wishing to testify in opposition to LB 189? All right, seeing none, is there anybody who wishes to testify in a neutral capacity? Hi there, my name is Carla Euler, that's K-A-R-L-A-U-H-L-I-R, -L -L and I'm from Verdigree, Nebraska. I am an educator, a uh, hair educator in the state of Nebraska, and I waited till the end so I could get both sides, and I do have notes. Okay. Um, I appreciated the senator that's not sitting here anymore uh, when he asked about uh, lowering some hours for people that were just to do um, non-chemical work. Um, as Mr. Um, McKeg said, uh, they are, they use, they have 600 hours in which they, uh, uh, it takes them in order to be able to properly do um, what LB189 is asking. And so I would look for something 600 hours or more. And what was not brought up uh, on either side is that we've got journeymen, well, not 
cosmetology, but there are journeymen. There are apprenticeships for plumbing, for electrical, and there is for um, cosmetology. It is not widely used. For those um, people that want to partake in our industry, but maybe don't have the funds like was, was saying, by the way, I was a single mom when I went to beauty school full time and I did work at Valentino's and uh, got most of my meals there <laughs> and it can be done, but there is an apprenticeship program. Now the owner of the salon has like a 20 page application. They have to um, be able to teach what these um, students would have learned in school. And that is something that is out there that has not been mentioned um, today. Um, so if there is someone that wants to maybe learn more about natural hair, then that salon owner would spend more time on teaching that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions from the committee? Senator Walls. Thank you. So are you saying that there's already, there's already a program available for somebody to do what the bill is asking? Well, they to... do have to have the hours sure. that school would have, but they are working in a salon setting and the um, instructor would be the salon owner or whoever in the salon is capable of doing that. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for coming. And we have anybody else who wishes to testify in a neutral capacity? Good afternoon. Um, my name is Naomi Thompson. That's N-Y-O-M-I-T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. And I'm representing Ivy Black Girl. Ivy Black Girl is a reproductive justice organization that centers black women, femmes, and girls because when we do, everyone benefits. I am testifying neutral to LB 189. Policy has historically been weaponized against black communities. And as a result, we are committed to building black political power to address the harm and chart a new experience of legislation. For us, that means intentionally including those most impacted by legislation to be centered and included in the policy creation process. LB 189, unfortunately, does not do that. In order to implement policy that is truly effective, we need to include natural hairstylists in the creation of the bill to ensure implementation doesn't cause more harm. Natural hair, the way it's styled and the way it's regulated is of importance. It takes conversations, the proper stakeholders and community members to make a policy of value. We urge you to indefinitely postpone LB 189 and revisit the best way to provide support to the natural hair stylist community. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. We didn't get the name of your helper today, though. <laughs> Her name is Troy Emery Jean. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> best testimony so far. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions from the committee at all? All right. Seeing none. Thank Thanks for coming you. in. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to testify in a neutral capacity? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will welcome up uh, Senator Cal back up to close. How do you follow that? Yeah. <laughs> For the record, before you start here, sorry, uh, we did have some letters uh, sent in, and we did have three in support and 20 as opponents. So, just for the record. Thank you very much for all of the testifiers today. Um, it takes a lot to come up here and sit and talk to people who are sitting there staring back at you. So I appreciate everybody who took the time out of their day to come out. Um, as I mentioned in my opening, the goal is to create opportunities for entrepreneurship, business growth, and job creation. For businesses who are in need of workers, which I believe that there are, 
Um, it gives them a choice in greater depth in terms of their applicant pool so that they can choose a person with the talent skill that is needed. And while this bill is about providing economic opportunities for Nebraskans, I want to briefly comment on the health and safety comments. Since the passage of the hair braiding bill in 2016, there have been no documented complaints in Nebraska pertaining to health and safety concerns, including or involving hair braiders. In the past four years, five other states have passed legislation like LB 189 is proposing and exempting natural hair styling has not posed any risks in these states. Um, I think we need to remember common sense surrounding who we choose to go to for cosmetology services. We rely on things like word of mouth, um, referrals from friends, Yelp reviews, Google reviews. I would trust that business owners make decisions that are in the best interests and in the interests of their customers. The other thing is um, we heard a lot of people talking about how if somebody is unlicensed, they could just do this from their home. Anyone can choose to just do this from their home if they are have a cosmetology license or not. No, they can't. Hey, wait. Actually, we will hold down comment, please. Thank the you. fact that testimony. the fact that people want to pass this kind of bill means they want to work within the law and they want to be able to do these services. Um, them being able to do this within the law doesn't mean that they're going to skip paying their taxes. The fact that they're working for this law probably means they're more willing to pay those taxes and to set up an actual shop. So cosmetologists would lose their licenses if they were caught, but they could certainly get away with doing it as well. So it's that's I found that to be a little bit disingenuous. Um, these are activities that we're discussing that are things that we do in our own homes. Um, the ability to be able to do them uh, for people is something that we've heard testimony from our, our second testifier that she would very much like to be able to add these services to her uh, hair braiding services, but she now has to go through cosmetology college because she can't offer just this little bit extra. So I think there are some accommodations that need to be made there. Um, instead of burdensome, burdensome regulations, I think niche entrepreneurs like this uh, should be given the chance to do what we all do in our homes every day. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? All right. Seeing none, that will close the hearing for LB 189. And we will now open up the next uh, hearing for LB 280. And welcome, Senator Blood. Yeah, you are just so nice and neat, and I'm all over. <laughs> I'll try to pick up. <laughs> You're a brief chairman. You're a brief chairman on the heels of Washington for cosmetology. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that many. Well, we didn't get supper yesterday. Not like it much today. We actually had a chair once that decided to eat Jimmy John's like at his desk one time during the hearing. That I'm was before to put that in my rules that we can. <laughs> I mean, it seems kind of like a no brainer that you don't do that. But... <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Senator Blood, whenever you are ready, you are ready to open for LB 280. Thank you. Well, good late morning, um, Chair Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Senator Carl Blood, spelled C-A-R-O-L, B's and boy, L-O-O-D's and dog, and I represent District 3, which is the western half of Bellevue and southeastern Papillion, Nebraska. Thank you for the opportunity to bring forward LB-280 regarding the Massage Therapy Mobility Compact. LB-280 allows Nebraska to join the Interstate Massage Therapy Compact, otherwise known as IMPACT. IMPACT will allow licensed massage therapists in Nebraska to practice in member states within the compact without having to obtain individual licenses when they want to practice in a different state. Each of these compact states agrees to mutually recognize the licenses issued by other member states. Once a licensed massage therapist in a home state is confirmed to have met eligibility, practicing licensure, they can apply for a multi-state license, become verified for eligibility by the Compacts Commission, and then can practice in all member states. 
Now, massage therapy has become an important piece of the healthcare puzzle. Massage reduces stress and increases relaxation. It reduces pain and muscle soreness and tension. It improves circulation, energy, and alertness. It lowers your heart rate and blood pressure, and it can improve your immune function. And let's face it, it just feels good. LB-280 is also part of a broader effort to aid military families and remove barriers to their employment as they are relocated. The Council of State Governments partners with the Department of Defense to support military families with these interstate compacts. Various fields that require licensure benefit from these multi-state agreements and allow more mobility, including doctors, nurses, psychologists, physical therapists, EMS, occupational therapists, audiology and speech language pathologists, counselors and physician's assistants. There are currently four compacts in place starting this year, and that is for teachers, massage therapists, cosmetologists, and dentists and their dental assistants. Next year, there'll be a social worker compact. This impact multi-state compact would remove barriers for licensure and therefore employment for massage therapists and create reciprocity between states. For the compact to take effect, only seven states would need to pass for this legislation. Spouses of military families have long faced high unemployment, currently at 22%. This high unemployment rate makes them among the highest demographic in the country. This leads to military families in Nebraska and across the country having difficulty building long-term financial futures, save for retirement, and find post-military careers in accordance to their experience and education. Combine these concerns with moving every two to three years and you've created a perfect licensure storm as you move state to state as a massage therapist. By the time they acquire a new state license, they might have to move again within several months. The absence of an interstate compact is a burden on military families and their ability to achieve stability or employment when they have to move. Not only do Nebraska licensed massage therapists benefit from this legislation, but the state itself and Nebraska consumers see an impact. Licensed massage therapists have an easier path for practicing between member states and their employment opportunities expanded into new, park, new markets and compacts. Their financial burden of applying for new licenses is lessened and can establish a continuity of care when clients or themselves relocate. Importantly, massage therapists who have spouses in the military or other occupations that require frequent moving do not have to perpetually reapply for a new state license. It also opens up additional job opportunities as they can practice across state lines should the neighboring state belong to the compact. For regulators, in Nebraska, LB280 Nebraska, LB lessens administrative burdens while still allowing them jurisdiction over their member states and licensing. Cooperation is also fostered with Nebraska being a member of the compact with licensing boards, collaborating on investigations and disputes between member states. Also, in the event of a public health emergency, mobility of licensed massage therapists is eased. Lastly, Nebraska itself is a, be a benefactor of impact. Nebraska's labor force and development of a new massage therapist business creating jobs and attracting new residents for the state. Consumers in Nebraska would also have more access to massage therapists if they have the ability to set up business with no barriers to licensure. Now, we've long heard legislature, legislators and advocates want to make Nebraska a more military-friendly state, so passing LB-280 is another step towards this. These interstate compacts lessen the burden for military spouses for employment and their families' financial prospects. The difficulty of moving and finding employment, schools for your children, and medical care is hard enough to accompany the unfamiliarity and sense of unease of moving to another region or state. These interstate compacts can ease these hurdles. Nebraska businesses and their ability to attract talent would have a boost as well as with more families being able to establish themselves. This bill, and I hope everybody's listening now, had the ability to be a win-win for Nebraska. However, that's not likely going to happen now. In Nebraska, our educational standard is 1,000 hours while the compact presents only 625 hours. So I wanna clarify some misinformation that you may have received, because I know I've certainly received it, and that's been put out to the masses. I want you to know that states are not required to modify their hours of education requirement for state licensure in these compacts. But in this compact, the 625 hour requirement applies only to the LMT seeking to have a multi-state license. Many in Nebraska, feel the compact is not what is best for Nebraska and have asked that we keep it in committee as they don't feel 625 hours is enough hours to be as skilled as those already practicing in our state, which I think you guys just kind of had that conversation in the previous bill. 
I will say that we've had others who have called and said the opposite that have been very much in favor of this bill. But the masses have been activated and come out against this with auto-generated opposition to this compact. So I do want to note that much of the opposition came from actually our massage schools who pointed out that they will lose income. And that's fair enough. I do thank you for your time today and I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'm in, I'm in a position that I feel it's necessary to ask you to keep this compact in committee, at least for now. Um, I encourage testifiers just to fill out the form at the door if in opposition, as I understand um, their concerns and choosing not to die on this hill today. Um, but I will say that there was one thing that I found really disturbing that had been generated by whomever where they they were curious as to who was behind this compact. Anybody who's worked with me knows that these compacts always come from the Department of Defense and CSG, Council State Governments. They're not from some dark group that is trying to bring in immigrants to work unlicensed in sweatshops. I just want to get that on record because that was intimated to me in multiple emails. That's not the purpose of this bill. The organizations that are behind these compacts are the Department of Defense at the federal level. They are done because reciprocity does not allow our, our military spouses to move from state to state to state. It only allows them to come and work in your state. But if they move in two to three years, they don't have the ability necessarily to have that same reciprocity elsewhere. So we're trying to create um, some continuity amongst all the states, and we've done so in some really excellent compacts, such as the psychology compact, such as the nurses compact, such as the doctors compact. They're very powerful, they're very successful, but again, especially since you've had a long hearing, I'm hoping that those that might oppose it will just say they oppose it on the way out, um, and we can let you guys have a little bit of time for lunch today. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Senator Reed. Thank you, Chairman uh, Hanson. Uh, <clears throat> I want to commend you. You've really been a champion over the years for setting up these compacts uh, along a number of things, and also uh, your support for military support uh, for spouses. Thank I you, think Senator. that's been helpful to the state. I think it's been very beneficial to the recipients of those rewards. The one question that I do have and that is with the amendment of to LB 280, uh, 280, and that is where it says, and I quote, have no greater liability than a state employee would have, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> Does it and, always uh, say yada, yada, yada? Yeah. I need to go fix that. So, I, I'm just curious how the state employee becomes the standard and why that was chosen. You know, I, I, I'm not sure why it was chosen, but I can tell you when you were chair of of HHS. That was when I had my very first two compacts passed. I believe you chair and Senator Howard was, was vice chair. And it was brought up by the legal community in Nebraska that we needed a liability clause. And it was approved way back then by the, the compacts. Um, and it's just basically to protect those um, in Nebraska that, um, you know, I don't understand why the standard is there, but it's to protect people from liability. Okay. I, I really have writers. no idea. I've never been asked that why an employee is the standard, but that's how it's been on every single one of our verbatim, our liability uh, oh. amendments that we've added. So good question. I think I'll find out that answer now because I'm curious too. Just curious. Thank yeah, you very much. Don't know. Thank you for being here. Unless we have a lawyer on this group that might know. I, I, usually I can throw a rock and hit a lawyer, but I guess not on this <laughs> committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hart. Senator Blood, do we have a or can we get a hold of a list of the states and the clock hours that each of them do require? So I, I'm just curious to know, is there truly a, a vast difference of requirements everywhere or not, particularly with the states that touch us as well as I get it, most states have some kind of military base in them somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so just curious what the, the nature of that comparison might look yeah like. i can definitely get you a list of, of all those hours i can tell you that when they do the compacts they bring in multiple states sure. um and unfortunately i don't think anybody from nebraska at this time was included but i do know that there's a conference and that nebraska felt that their questions weren't answered and that it was being rushed i can tell you that these aren't rushed 
it takes about two years to form a compact. Lots of meetings, because I've sat in on the ones for teachers and some other compacts that have been passed. Um, but I do know that the 600 and I think it's 25 hours that they came up with was um, based on all of the states that they looked at and they thought that that was the fairest that they could be with the states that they met with. Clearly, Nebraska is 400 hours above that. So it's, it's actually quite a jump. Um, but, but I respect why they feel that they want that. And, you know, I'm not a massage therapist. I'm, I'm not going to disagree with, with what they're saying, but I think it's unfortunate for our military spouses. They may very well have reciprocity in Nebraska, but that's a very different thing than, than interstate compacts, um, because they can keep their home license and move from state to state to state. So, but if you would like me to find all the hours for all the states, I can get that for you. Just curious what it looks like. We, we tend to have a theme in Nebraska, which is if it's licensed, our standards are here. Someone else's might not be as high, makes yeah. reciprocity impossible. So um, just it makes it harder. And But I will say that I do understand standards, especially when it comes to things that have to do with healthcare and massage is part of healthcare. But at the same token, um, yeah, what, where, where do we draw the line? Because it does prevent things like this from happening. We will likely be the only state that doesn't participate in this as a result. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, will you be closing or? I, I, I will. Yeah, there's not like 100 people behind me. I will definitely stay for my closing. Okay, cool. All right. So we will take our first testifier in support of LB280. Is there anybody wishing to testify in support? Okay. Seeing none, is there anybody that wishes to testify in opposition? Uh, my name is Brianna Cudley, B-R-I-A-N-A-C-U-D-L-Y. I'm a massage therapist in Fremont, Nebraska. I've been a practitioner for 18 years. And I oppose 280. Now, initially, I was excited about the idea of a compact, but this bill does not live up to our expectations. While compacts work well for many professions, the national standards for massage therapy make it difficult. The educational standards for entry-level massage therapy varies from state to state, city to city, and county to county. Nebraska requires 1,000 hours of entry-level education, and the compact only requires 625. The Federation's ELAP blueprint states, it is vital to understand what the core is not. It is not a complete massage school curriculum, and that these 625 hours, quote, should be part of every entry-level massage instruction program, but not the entirety. The biggest discrepancy in hours comes from the core of anatomy, physiology, and pathology and clinical practice before graduating. The blueprint requires only 80 hours combined of A and P and pathology, whereas we require 300 combined. It's not even a third of what we require. Uh, the purpose of licensing is really to protect the public from the things they don't know that they don't know, right? So this bill does not require compact licensees to designate themselves to the public as being on a lower educational license. And part of protecting the public is ensuring they know the type of practitioner they are getting. The bill does not require visiting compact licensees to report to the state they are practicing here in Nebraska. The proposed Matilda database will have all compact licensees in the system, but there's no requirement that they will have to tell the state that they are actually here practicing. This makes it very difficult to know who is practicing here legally, especially to the public, as Matilda is only for licensing boards, whereas the public here in Nebraska can search the DHH website and find out who's actually licensed. <clears throat> the bill does not require, let's see, it makes it very difficult to know who's practicing here. Part of the public is ensuring they know a practitioner is legitimate. The bill does not require the compact licensees to take a jurisprudence exam to show that they know the laws here in Nebraska. And as you guys all know, every state is different. Uh, for example, here in Nebraska, we have a state license, uh, an establishment license, and a mobile establishment license. Um, that's not the same in every state. 
So, um, you know, part of protecting the public is ensuring that practitioners actually know the laws. I am aware that the compact would be helpful for military spouses. And while I do not disagree with this in any way, I do not think that we do it at the expense of the public. Nebraska has very good reciprocity, which was just updated in 21. And also in 21, state statute 38129.01 was enacted so that the DHHS can issue a temporary credential license uh, to military spouses for all but dentists in the Uniform Credentialing Act. This gives them time to not only get all of their reciprocity information together, but to work while they do it. So um, this gives the spouse time to gather everything and the, sto the state knows that they are here working. We know there will be fees. Uh, it's not yet been stated what these fees will be, but the state would have to implement the Matilda uh, programming, the database along with fingerprinting, which we don't do right now. And the state's not just gonna do this out of the kindness of their heart. That's gonna be passed on to the licensees, whether we are actually licensed in the compact or just here in Nebraska. So what this means is that Nebraska LMTs would have more education and more government oversight than the compact licensees. We'll pay more for our state license, whether we choose to be in the compact or not, and the public will not be aware of the differences. I really do like the idea of a compact, um, but this bill leaves a lot to be desired. Nebraska is not a state that quickly enters compacts, and uh, we usually wait until the kinks are worked out. So let's work out the kinks before moving forward with this. Um, I'm open to any questions that you guys may have. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yes, and her. You mentioned reciprocity mm -hmm. that Nebraska currently has. Yep. Roughly, do you know how many states we have reciprocity with as? as um, anybody who's licensed um, can uh, apply for reciprocity. What they do have to do is be able to show that they uh, graduated from uh, an accredited program. Um, they do have to pass the MBLEX, which is the national exam. And even if they came from a school that was 500 hours or 650 or 750, um, they can use years of experience along with continuing education and college credit in order to earn their reciprocity. It sounds like that's already a pretty big list of potential states. Yes. Um, I will say we have Kansas, Wyoming, uh, Minnesota that do not have state licensure. And so it makes it more difficult for them. There's um, actually, if you want to go to Kansas or Wyoming, you can and say that you are a massage therapist. You just put up a sign. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Any else wishing to test that Hi, good morning. Oh, uh, yeah, it's still morning. <laughs> I think. Uh, good morning. My name is Christine Roberts, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-R-O-B-E-R-T-S. I am here representing the Nebraska State Board of Massage Therapy for the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, the Nebraska State Board of Massage Therapy's opposition is based on two primary factors that you've already heard, uh, the lack of equivalent education requirements and the ability to track the massage therapist entering our state. Interstate compacts work well when similar education requirements for the given profession are required among the states entering a compact. Professions such as physical therapy and nursing are excellent examples. In the United States, physical therapists must earn a Doctor of Physical Therapy degree from a Commission of Accreditation in Physical Therapy Education Accredited Physical Therapy Education Program and pass a state licensure exam. This requirement ensures that all physical therapists have achieved similar competencies regardless of where they receive their education. Educational requirements for massage therapists do not have the same safeguard. States range from 500 to 1,000 hours of education to be eligible for a license. Nebraska, along with New York State, have the highest requirement of 1,000 hours. A total of 11 states, including Nebraska, mandate more education than what the Interstate Massage Compact requires, 625, for membership. 31 states require less than 625 hours for licensure. This inconsistency makes it very difficult for the Interstate Compact to work effectively. Oh. LB 280 does not outline a method of notifying a state that an interstate compact licensed massage therapist is working in the remote state. 
a licensed massage therapist could be disciplined in another member state. And the only way Nebraska would know the same LMT is in our state is if a complaint on LMT would be received. By this time, our residents' safety would have already been jeopardized. If Nebraska were to become a member of the compact, the state would lose the ability to know who is working as a massage therapist within our borders. The Nebraska State Board of Massage Therapy feels for these reasons and in the interest of public safety, LB 280 should not move out of committee. Any questions? Okay, thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions? We're seeing none. Great. Anyone else wishing to testify in opposition? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Afternoon. Sometime today. Welcome. Hello. Uh, my name is Kimberly Adams Johnson, K I M B E R L Y A D A M S J O H N S O N. I'm a licensed massage therapist and have been practicing for almost 23 years. I served on the Nebraska State Board of Massage Therapy for 10 years and the Board of Directors for the Federation of State Massage Therapy Boards for three years. I sat on numerous committees and task forces for the FSMTB as well. I am against 280 as it is written, not against compacts per se. The Interstate Massage Compact or IMPACT is aptly named in my opinion. It will have a significant impact on the wellness of our massage schools in Nebraska an impact, financial impact on the state and potentially all licensed massage therapists as well. My primary issue with LB 280 though is the number of educational hours that are presented for the multi-state licenses. The Entry Level Analysis Project or ELAP is a research project initiated by the Coalition of National Massage Therapy Organizations in 2012. The project goals were to define knowledge and skill components of entry level education and recommend the minimum number of hours schools should teach to prepare graduates for safe and competent practice in the massage profession. It was completed in December of 2013. The work group's eventual recommendation was that approximately 625 hours of capable instruction would be required for students to acquire just core skills and abilities. These skills were referred to as the core. That being said, major organizations made a statement with or the, uh, sorry, the Coalition of National Massage Therapy Organizations, which included seven major organizations, made a statement with the release of the ELAP, indicating the contents of this report are seen as the core, the foundational knowledge and skills every beginning massage therapist should possess. They should be part of every entry level massage instructional program, but not the entirety. Uh, the statement goes on to say, many massage therapy instructional programs already provide more than 625 education hours. The coalition recommends that in addition to the meeting, the total education hours mandated in the individual states, every massage school curriculum include core report recommended subjects, topics, and weighting. The core is now being presented as the complete massage school education for every licensed massage therapist. In recent documents defending the compact, which um, I included in my notes here, um, it's the why of the 625. Um, the FSMTB stated that nationally, the average number of clock hours of education was 723. Why decrease the national average by almost 100 hour, hours? What happened to diversity and innovation and providing greater instructional depth as the coalition endorsed 10 years ago? Craig Knowles, the president of the FSMTB, stated on June 22, 2022, that the 625 is the total minimum education. That gives the compact commission leeway if somebody's entry level transcript is 500 hours, the commission can accept other forms of education to make up the difference. And if someone doesn't qualify for a compact licensure, they can still apply to whatever state they want to get a license. They just don't qualify for the past, fast pass to licensure. I reached out to Mr. Knowles with many of these concerns. I received this answer. I attached some of the points regarding the 625. This is the reasoning behind the choice. I hope it helps. He sent me a document that mentions the ELAP. Clearly, I know the genesis of the ELAP, how it led to the Model Practice Act and the 625 hours. His cursory answer gave me little to no confidence that this bill is fleshed out beyond what is touched upon in the bill. I'm also concerned that LB 280 states the commission may levy and collect an annual assessment from each member state and impose fees on licensees of member states whom it grants a multi-state license to cover the cost of the operations and activities of the commission and its staff, which must be a total amount sufficient to cover the annual, annual budget as approved each year for which revenue is not provided by other sources. Mr. Knowles made the comment on social media, there will be fees, uncertain what they will be. 
The compact will have staff processing, applications, and notifying states of new licenses, so there will be costs. Still working on the structure of the compact, so fees and things like that will be discussed later. How can we be asked to blindly support a bill that we do not have any fiscal impact data on? The FSMTB is quick to say the compact license is a privilege you must qualify for. It is not a right. But with a project of this magnitude, the money to support the implementation will not solely come from those participating in the compact. It will impact the state and all licensed massage therapists as well. And to answer your question, um, North Dakota requires 750 hours of education. <clears throat> Excuse me. Illinois requires 600. South Dakota is 500. Colorado is 500. And then Iowa is 500. So just the states around us. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the committee? Seeing none. All right. Yesterday I saw the brightest, somebody testified with the brightest shoes I've ever seen in my life. Oh, yeah. And your hair is, <laughs> yeah. she's probably I, the best, the I brightest and best hair I've seen. So I was going to say, I think all the cosmetologists thought I was here for them. <laughs> 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 they kept going, hey, hey. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming to testify. Is there any of us wishing to testify in opposition? Okay. Seeing none. Is there anybody who wishes to testify in a neutral capacity? Good oh. afternoon, Chairman Hanson and members of the HHS committee. Um, my name is Laura Ebke, L-A-U-R-A-E-B-K-E. -E. I'm the senior fellow at Platt Institute, which is a free market think tank here in Nebraska. Um, because the dinner bell has already rung, I'm going to um, not read my testimony because you'll hear much of it tomorrow when we do the cosmetology compact. Um, but the bottom line is um, the Platt Institute believes that, um, that, that licensing compacts are just fine. There's no problem with them. Um, they they uh, give a little bit of um, authority to the compact commission as opposed to the state. So the state agrees as part of the compact that um, compact rules and regs have the force of law in the state. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, what I will point out, and we'll talk about this tomorrow maybe more, a, a little bit more, but um, I've handed out a um, comparison. There is no reason that compacts and universal recognition um, can't work together. And in fact, um, from the standpoint of um, of, of providing more workforce into our state, using them together is probably more effective. Um, the one thing I would say, Senator Hardin, um, you asked about a database. I would be happy if, if Senator, um, Senator Blood would like me to do this. Um, I've got access to a, a national database and I can just pull those numbers this afternoon, send them to you. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Okay. Seeing none. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Anybody else wishing to test by neutral capacity? All right, seeing none, then welcome Senator Blood back up to close on LB 280. And for the record, we did have two letters of support and five letters in opposition. So to start, I'm going to actually read directly from the site because I, I think there's still some confusion in reference to the bed database and people not having to report because that is simply not true. If that was true, we would have psychologists and doctors and nurses and physical therapists and others in our state working in, we wouldn't know. And that's not the case. That is not how it works. State licensure boards benefit by maintaining control over the State Practice Act and licensure processes, a centralized database of disciplinary action records, authority to require submission to FBI fingerprint-based criminal background checks, and from economies of scale due to reduced administrative costs. So not more money, less money. I'm sure you have fiscal notes. You'll see that the costs for our interstate compacts are nothing. I mean, there's a cost, but it's, it's not a big cost. It's a minor cost. Um, and I think it's really telling when they say that 31 states require less than 625 hours. I thought that was a very telling, and that was not something that I was aware of. So I want you to know that this database actually is an extra layer of safety. And I thought I said that in my introduction, because if you're a ne'er-do-well and you do something in another state, and we know sometimes ne'er-do-wells like to move from state to state in hopes that they don't get caught, right? This database prevents that from happening. So it not only protects the consumer, but protects the people that hire these, these professionals. So the state does know in interstate compacts who's coming into their state to work with the interstate compact. 
And then I thought it was interesting too, when they talked about reciprocity and then they gave Senator Hardin this long list of things that had to be done in order to participate in the reciprocity. Well, with the interstate compact, you hold a home license and you're allowed to practice across state lines. And to, so to say that the, the language isn't right, these interstate compacts, and I think it's not right for Nebraska because of the amount of hours that we expect. The other things that were said, and I mean this with all due respect, don't pertain to this compact. The hours, the thousand hours definitely does, and I understand that concern. But, you know, there's been 222 pieces of legislation passed since 2016 across the United States in reference to interstate compacts, and it's because they work. At least 44 states have at least one interstate compact, at least one. And so in reference to the fingerprinting, that's in all of the compacts, not just this compact. There's no additional costs for licensure. And by the way, if, if indeed we were to pass a compact in Nebraska, which it, clearly we can't, they would still be allowed to keep their home license. They wouldn't have to join the compact. And to say that people would be confused and wouldn't know whether they had to join the compact or could keep their home license, that's not how it happens. When you come into the state, because we know you're in the state, you're going to be given that ability to, to do an either or. I can tell you that, especially with our psychologists here in Nebraska, it has been a blessing because, and I think we talked about this in the teacher's compact and some of you were in that room when I talked about that. As a psychologist, if you had a client that went on vacation in Florida and they had a mental health crisis, you couldn't talk to them on the phone. You couldn't cancel them on the phone because you weren't licensed in Florida. But with interstate compacts, if that state belongs to the compact, now, thank goodness, our professionals can also practice across state lines through telehealth. So I, I, I just, I want to go on record as making sure that people know that interstate compacts are not boogeymen, that the concerns that were risen, that were raised today outside of the hours, and they're right on the hours, and I agree with that 100%, is the same as every compact we've had. This is not an outlier. These compacts take two to three years of a lot of work, a lot of meetings, and I'm just sorry that, that Nebraska felt that they were left out on it. I can tell you with the teacher's compact that I personally called people and brought them in on the meetings. Um, so I think that in the long run, we miss out, but I surely understand why you would want to keep it in committee. So with that, I thank you for your time. I hadn't planned on not having to close, but I thought we had to make sure that we put the, the correct responses on record thank you any questions from the committee all right saying none all thank right. you thank you and that will close the hearing for lb 280 and we will open up the last hearing for the morning lb 78 and welcome center day to open on what i'm sure will be a very short hearing. as short as we can <laughs> i know you all had a late night last night <laughs> I'm going to open and I'm also going to wave my closing. Okay. So, Good afternoon, Chairman Hansen and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Jen Day, that's J-E-N-D-A-Y, and I represent Legislative District 49 in Sarpy County. I'm here this afternoon to introduce LB78, which would update and harmonize Nebraska's definition of massage therapy so that, so that it is considered a wellness and health service rather than a cosmetic procedure. The current definition in Chapter 38 was enacted in 1986, and since then, a number of changes in other areas of statute have made this definition obsolete. Specifically, the state's Uniform Credentialing Act, which recognizes massage therapy as a form of health care. Currently, 21 states, as well as many private insurers, the VA, Medicare Advantage plans, and HSAs treat massage therapy as a health and wellness service and provide varying levels of coverage in their plans. Additionally, in practice, we're seeing doctors in Nebraska utilize massage therapy as a health service, such as Dr. Thomas Brooks of UNMC, who noted in a story a few years back that massage therapy not only serves as a relief for chronic pain in his patients, but also as a way to ease anxiety for patients before major procedures. 
These observations are consistent with emerging research that consistently shows that massage therapy is an effective way to manage chronic pain. These kinds of examples should resonate at a time when we're trying to find ways to offer alternatives to medication in light of the potential for dependency that we've seen, especially in chronic pain management medication. As a result of the nationwide opioid epidemic, this kind of emphasis on non-pharmaceutical pain management was recently passed into law with the bipartisan No Pain Act, which was co-sponsored by 26 Democratic senators and 24 Republican senators, and focuses on removing barriers to non-opioid pain management at the federal level. This approach was supported by the American Medical Association and the American Academy of Pain, Man pain Management, both of whom supported the bill. A lot has changed since 1986 in how the medical community views massage therapy. While LB78 primarily is a minor cleanup that harmonizes massage therapy with how it's already classified in the State Uniform Credentialing Act, it also aligns our state's definition of massage therapy with how it's currently being utilized in Nebraska and nationwide. We'll have testifiers here today from the American Massage Therapy Association, so they'll be able to best answer technical questions, but I'm happy to attempt to answer any questions you may have now. All right, thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you. All right, we will take our first testifier in support of LB78. It's been so long. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Christine Roberts, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-E. R-O-B-E-R-T-S. I'm here on behalf of the Nebraska State Board of Massage Therapy. The current definition of massage therapy was established in 1986. Since then, the profession has seen significant changes in how massage therapy is perceived and utilized within health and wellness. Massage therapists often work directly with medical doctors, chiropractors, physical therapists, and mental health care professionals. Many massage therapists work in the same offices, clinics, or hospitals as these these other health care providers. Even many standalone licensed establishments are part of an integrated health care referral system. During phase one of the 2021 Nebraska COVID-19 vaccination plan, massage therapists were recognized by many Nebraska County Health Departments as health care providers, which allowed them to receive their first vaccinations along with other vital medical providers. The 2021 American Massage Therapy Association Consumer Survey found that 63% of consumers who received a massage for health and wellness reasons stated it was part of a treatment plan from a doctor or medical provider. The massage therapy profession has evolved into a key aspect in many individuals' regular health program to manage pain and stress. The Nebraska State Board of Massage Therapy feels it is time to adjust the state's definition of massage therapy to accurately depict the functional changes in the professions. And on a personal note, I get massages about every two weeks to uh, manage my migraines. And so I definitely believe it's a health care. Any questions for me? Thank you for your testimony. Are there questions? I might have a couple questions. Okay. Of those healthcare professionals that you say that you typically work with, massage therapists typically work with, <clears throat> one of the concerns they had, that I've heard from probably one from each of those professions is, this, I just have to say for the record, you know, I think I already know the answer. This does not expand the scope of massage therapy in any way, does it? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay, good. Just want to make sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll take the next test fire in support of LB78. Hello. My name is Kimberly Adams Johnson, K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y-A-D-A-M-S-J-O-H-N-S-O-N. I'm a licensed massage therapist and have been practicing for almost 23 years. I am testifying in favor of LB78 for numerous reasons. On August 25th, 2020, I was diagnosed with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. As an LMT, I have seen hundreds of clients over my career with debilitating chronic pain, but I never thought I would be living with it. I began treatment in September of 2020. My team of healthcare providers were very candid about recommending massage therapy as a non-opioid alternative in conjunction with the campaign against the opioid epidemic. On September 18th, 2017, 37 states attorneys general, including Nebraska, signed a letter to encourage doctors to prioritize non-opioid pain management options 
over opioid prescriptions for the treatment of chronic non-cancer pain. Part of the letter states, when patients seek treatment for any of the myriad conditions that cause chronic pain, doctors should be encouraged to explore and prescribe effective non-opioid alternatives, ranging from non-opioid medications such as NSAIDs to physical therapy, acupuncture, massage, and chiropractic care. Massage therapists are recognized as allied healthcare professionals in the United States. Allied health encompasses a broad group of health professionals who use scientific principles and evidence-based practice for the diagnosis, evaluation, and treatment of acute and chronic diseases, promote disease prevention and wellness for optimum health, and supply uh, administration and management skills to support healthcare systems in a variety of settings. These professionals include emergency medical personnel, occupational therapists, physical therapists, other healthcare providers, and support, support personnel, such as medical assistants and massage therapists, to name a few. Estimates have suggested that as much as 60% of the United States healthcare workforce may be classified as allied health care. Allied Health plays an essential role in the delivery of healthcare and related services in the U.S. and throughout the world. Massage therapists have been under the purview of the Uniform Credentialing Act for years. Um, a healthcare provider is defined as a facility that's licensed under the Healthcare Facility Licensure Act, a healthcare professional licensed under the Uniform Credentialing Act, a professional healthcare service entity, and an organization or association of healthcare professionals licensed under the Uniform Credentialing Act. I feel that LB78 provides agreement between the massage therapy statutes and the Uniform Credentialing Act, our position as allied healthcare professionals, and our role in the campaign against the opioid epidemic. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. I think our next test bar in support. Welcome back. Hello. I'm back. Yes, who's back? Hello, everybody. Once again, I am Brianna Cudley, B R I A N A C U D L Y. I'm a Nebraska licensed massage therapist, as well as the board member and government relations chair for the American Massage Therapy Association of Nebraska. Our members and our board support this bill. It really is just a cleanup bill aligning Nebraska massage therapy statute with other state statute and official statements, as well as federal designations. A few examples are uh, the Uniform Credentialing Act recognizing us as healthcare. The Nebraska Board of Massage Therapy position letter from 2020 states it's important to understand that massage therapy is recognized as a healthcare practice. In 2017, Age, uh, then A.G. Peterson signed a letter encouraging massage therapy as part of a non-opioid pain management response. Flex, HSA, Workman's Comp, personal injury, some private insurance, Medicare Advantage, all cover massage therapy. Uh, the NAICS code, which is the North American Industry Classification System for massage is 621399, offices of all other miscellaneous healthcare practitioners. Along with aligning statute, the small update will help make a difference for us legislatively. <laughs> Over the last several years, there have been numerous bills attempting to tax massage therapy as a personal service. Each bill, we have to dedicate time and money to providing uh, proving that massage therapy is a health care and that taxing us will set a precedent of taxing all health care. This small change will make that process much easier, if not completely prevented. It's a well-written bill covering all the bases without changing the scope of practice of massage therapy, and we ask for your support in moving this bill forward. Great. Any questions from the committee? Senator Walls? I don't have a question. I just always want to say thanks for coming to Fremont. <laughs> I rearranged clients to be here today. I don't know how... I don't know if you guys know how upset my clients are that I'm here today, but... <laughs> Probably. Thank you so much for oh, coming. Yeah, thank you. It's good to see you. Thanks. Good. No questions. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, everybody. I hope you get some time for lunch today before your next <laughs> session. You should. Uh, anybody else wishing to testify in support of LB78? Seeing none. Is there anybody who wishes to testify in opposition to LB78? Seeing none. Is there anybody that wishes to testify in neutral capacity to LB78? Seeing none. Senator Day has waived her closing, and so that will close the hearing. Well, before I officially close it, let me make sure I do my due diligence here. Yes, we did have 16 letters in support uh, for LB78 and zero in opposition. So with that, that will close our hearing for LB78 yeah. and close our hearings for the morning. We'll be back at 1.30.